Hey how you doing? Hope you all are doing great. As you seen in the thumbnail, in this video, we are gonna see, what if Naruto take Fu in Waterfall and seduce her for massive harem. This is part 2, and before getting into video. I request you to check the author of this fanfic, and show some love and support. Name of the story is. Cry of the Raiju by Kiteno Seryu, do check it out. All details in description. And if you want next part of this series. Please leave a like share, and consider subscribe. Let's get into the video. Also check out Petron for uncensored spicy content, link in description. Anger had boiled into Naruto's mind as he felt the intense rage as begin to stir some of Kurama's chakra inside him. The chakra had become an addiction to his anger in which he had felt the animalistic behavior come into place, the animal part of him coming at him, filling his mind with the intention and sense that the hunt was afoot. If he couldn't get direct answers from his master, he couldn't get any answers from him at all whatsoever, he was going to shred his face and rip his work to bits. He never knew nothing, no a damn thing about his family, his heritage, or if there was anyone alive that was even blood related to him. Seeing now that finding out what his heritage was gave him some aspect of happiness, relief, and relief, knowing that he wasn't the only Uzumaki. Yet he had come to know that the Sanin had lied to him, he knew who this clan was, the old pervert was around during the Second Shinobi War. He was the master of Yandame, student of Sandame, he would have known who the second Jinchuriki of Kurama was. How much was he lied to? How much was hidden from him? Did the Sandame know, did Tsunade or Kakashi know? Just how much was light and hidden from him due to his status? Naruto snarled as he stomped through the rubble of Yuzushiagakure no Sado. His snarl temporarily became a deep frown. By home? He thought. I had a home outside of Konoha, I had family outside of Konoha. And I was kept from it. Naruto thought, tears lining his eyes as he realized he was most likely the last of his kind. Though the scroll in his arms had said that some Uzumaki clan members had managed to escape the genocide, there was no telling if they were truly alive or not. Naruto wiped the tears away before continuing to his destination. He could feel the rage continue to bubble, preparing to form the first tale before it was reverted back as an aura around him. The anger was coming out in plentiful amounts, though he managed to hold it at bay, only for it to transform into pure rage. And the rage kept on. He continued to walk through the ruins, the voices of Kurama and Kamina, arguing in his mind before he snapped at them. Both of you, shut the hell up right now. He screamed in his mind before he launched his conscious within his mind as he appearing before them as he stared at Kamina who was growling at Kurama and Kurama doing the same within his cage, the two fox-like beings, though being of opposite races, wanted to rip each other's throats out. The two that were holding a mutual respect and had some amusement with Naruto's week of training, were no longer in the premises of Naruto's mind, only two beings that hated each other, as one stopped one's chakra from continuing to corrupt the boy and the other at rage from the other's actions. What in the hell are you two doing? He roared out at the two, you two are making me even more pissed off. I'm trying to stop you from using Kurama's chakra, it's too potent and addicting for even you. Kamina snarled as he held a firm grip on the beast's chakra, which was slightly burning him, but at the same time his chakra was affecting Kurama, but not to the same extent. It was simply giving the crimson fox a headache from hell. I understand your anger Naruto, but you do not need to let your rage get the best of you, you are not to let this beast let you become consumed by your anger even further than you are now. Kamina said as he pushed the Bijuu's chakra back. The fool deserves it. The pervert had information about the boy's past that he had deserved to know, but kept it hidden about it. How would you feel if you had no information about your own family? Garama snarled as he looked at the boy, I wouldn't have a doubt that Kashina would have felt the same way. He said, giving a slight feral grin before Naruto gave him a glare with his own crimson fox-like eyes. I may be pissed at Jiraiya. But don't think you have the same right to talk about this Kashina lady or about my family, even if she was your host or not. His crimson eyes were cold as he huffed heavily, you of all beings should have told me if you knew that woman, but I guess even you don't have the heart to tell a young boy his one wish as he was orphaned, and to become pariah by the people who fear you. Naruto said as he turned as he growled deeply before looking back. I want answers and if I can't get them the easy way, I'll get it the only way possible by breaking them. How are you going to do that Naruto, let your rage out of control. Kamina stared at the young blonde with narrowed eyes, it would be pointless to do so, your rage will blind you, and even as strong as you think you are, your words are simply that. Words. You're not even at a level to compare yourself to Jiraiya. The Raiju told the boy in hopes that the blonde will come to his senses. The Jinchuriki stopped as he looked at the Thunder Beast with a serious look, with what I've been taught even if I'm not at the level of that pervert, I will give him a piece of my mind, no matter how many times I fall. I will make him regret lying to me. He slowly faded from his mindscape before leaving parting words, no more goofing off, no more games, no more childish antics. This time, the mask comes off all the way. He said. 
he opened his eyes to see the rocky ruins of the once great village. His crimson eyes were now colder, having a pale blue illuminate within the crimson, his whiskers feral, the outlines of his eyes and lips bore a black aggressive nature of that of a fox, and his hair was wild. Yet among all that, his anger was still his own, even with what little of the QB's chakra was in him at the moment. His chakra fluxed, releasing as he stared out at the campsite that was not too far ahead of him. His eyes narrowed, clenching the scroll in his hand as he walked forward, he was going to get as much information out as possible from the Toad Sage. You better pray Iro Senen cause you're going to feel the wrath of Inuzumaki. He yelled in his mind as he marched onwards to the campsite. Naruto and Jiraiya's campsite. Jiraiya was sitting on the riverside trying to come up with some inspiration for his next novel, Itcha Itcha Tactics. He sighed as the ideas were found to be lacking. Hmm there are no women to peep on here. He said. His eyes brightened however as he came to realize something. Naruto's Warwick no Jutsu. The Gaki is a genius for creating that Jutsu. Maybe he'll let me see it again, and then I can get some inspiration for the book. He giggled perversely before hearing the snapping of a twig and the rustling of vegetation. His eyes narrowed as he whipped out a kunai and clutched it in a reverse grip, in case it was an enemy. He then released a breath of relief when he found that it was his 14-year-old pupil that emerged from the brush. Oh, it's just you, Naruto. Where'd you get that big scroll? On second thought before you answer, I have something else to ask you, I. Silence, Hiro Senen. Naruto roared, silencing his sensei. Jiraiya raised a curious eyebrow. Naruto, what's up with the angry face? Why are you so mad? He asked. Naruto's eyes flashed crimson, and Jiraiya took a step back in surprise, as he felt the killing intent that shot forth from his blonde disciple. Why am I so mad, Hiro Senen? Do you want to know why? Well first answer me this. Tell me. Where are we? Jiraiya blinked in confusion. What are you talking about, Gaki? We're in Yuzu no Kuni. He replied. Naruto stamped the large scroll in his arms on the ground and stared at Jiraiya with pure unadulterated rage, and there was a hint of betrayal in there as well. Jiraiya wondered why Naruto was feeling this way only to be tossed the large scroll. Read the last entry. He told his sensei. Jiraiya's eyes narrowed at the rude tone his student spoke to him with, but decided to humor the boy. He opened the scroll and skimmed through it before reaching the last entry. As he had reached the last entry he came to realize just why Naruto was so angry with him. He gulped audibly as he read the author of the scroll's final entry before looking up at Naruto, whose eyes bore vertical slits for pupils. Naruto, I. Now tell me, Jiraiya-sensei. Naruto spoke the name of his sensei, venom evident in his tone which caused the older man to wince, where? The fuck? Are we? Jiraiya felt his heart beat faster slightly, guilt coming in as his eyes lowered, once he closed his eyes and sighed. He understood the reasons why Naruto was like this, the betrayal of coming here, not knowing that this was his ancestral home until today. The boy had probably figured that Jiraiya had known and probably felt betrayed by him. He was so right on the point that the boy assumed he knew the information he so desperately wished to know. Jiraiya knew so much about his heritage, the Uzumaki clan were his inspiration for using seals before they fell, and even afterwards as he grew to become a master, but nothing that will be compared to Kashina or her family members. The boy was denied so much, he was put through more than what any normal shinobi or human being could ever handle. The isolation, the glares, the insults, all of them would drive any man insane. He was surprised a boy hadn't left the village to live in a different one. However, as much as he wanted to tell the boy he just couldn't bring himself to it. If he told him about his father, he would be hunted down by Iwa Ninja, possibly Kumo. He could tell him about his mother, but even still he was worried about what the boy's reaction would be. I am sorry Naruto I just can't he saw the boys become unmoving, but there was a hint of loathing behind them, and he could see it. I can't tell you yet, not until you're ready he said calmly. Oh so you think I'm not ready to know anything. Naruto lowered his head as he chuckled ominously as he glared at the white-haired man coldly. What gives you the right to think I'm not ready to know anything when it's my own right to know who my parents were who my clan members were? To hear you say that I'm not ready. It disgusts me. He said as his eyes darkened, I'm not some war orphan Jiraiya, I'm the damn host of QB no Yoko, I'm the pariah of the village of Kanahagakur no Sado, I'm the child who is lashed by everyone, because I bear the being who caused the destruction of the village 14 years ago. If I find knowledge about my clan and someone knows of it, you bet your damn life I'm going to get anything out of it. Jiraiya slightly narrowed his eyes as he looked at Naruto, no matter how much the blonde's words had hurt, to say a threat that he couldn't back up was cocky and arrogant on the blonde's part. So you're going to try to force information out of me? The large man smirked at the boy's serious look. What makes you think you can? I'm one of the Sanin, I've trained the Yandame Hokage to become what he was. I'm on par with Akage, what makes a genin like you think you have what it takes to face me? He said. Naruto slightly smirked upon the middle-aged man's words. 
well as the ninja coat says. He disappeared into a burst of speed, and Jiraiya's eyes widened as the blonde came right in front of him, with his fist already reared back for a punch. Look underneath the underneath he said as his fist had connected to Jiraiya's forearm, which the older man had raised to block the strike. He launched another first as he rapidly punched the Sanin's forearms with heavy hits. Brown you out by crossfade. Jiraiya was slightly surprised by the blonde's burst of speed, with the weights and seals on him, he should have slowed down to a low chunin speed or high genin speed. However, seeing now that his speed was still at a high chunin level speed. His hits, though were of rage, were strong on their own accord as well, about a low chunin or near mid chunin. His attacks were slow though due to the heavy baggage on him. He must have been hiding his full skill from me, with the weights off, he must be around a mid chunin level speed. Compared to his fight with Niji, he only brought this kind of speed with QB's chakra. This though. This is all him but why hide it? He thought. Bireya noticed the blonde's leg come at him from the side, and he grabbed it with ease, before he threw the blonde a great distance back. Naruto slammed on the ground once, but quickly leaped back as he skidded a few yards on his feet. He snarled as he made a hand sign. The cross-shaped hand sign for his signature jutsu. Hage Bunshin no jutsu. He had summoned ten clones. The blonde looked at Jiraiya with narrowed eyes and then knelt down as he looked at his clones and sent them out to go. The ten clones prepared their kunai as all of them charged at the white-haired ninja. They all rushed out, scattered as three jumped into the air, two slid on the ground aiming at the Sanin's legs, and the remaining half prepared a frontal assault. Jiraiya gasped at the ones descending and quickly grabbed the closest one. He then jumped back, bunshin in hand, in order to avoid the strikes from the other nine kage bunshins. As he landed, he grabbed the captive clone's wrist, and he took the kunai away from him. Throwing it at one of the charging ones, he impaled it through the skull, causing it to poof out of sight. As he did that he held the kage bunshin he had captive, and threw it back at another one of the clones, sending the two rolling on the ground. He then quickly ducked beneath a punch from another airborne bunshin. He then twisted to catch the clone by the ankle, since it had overshot its target, and with amazing strength, the white-haired shinobi launched the depelgenger towards the two of its brethren that Jiraiya had knocked aside earlier, hitting the other two, directly leaving them to explode into a cloud of smoke upon impact. As the other six came he quickly flashed through hand signs and slammed his hand on the ground before they could come any further. Oten. Yumi Numa. Soon the earthly ground collapsed onto the clones, causing them to fall into an adhesive mud-like substance that was similar to quicksand. As they continued to move around, they groaned as they all exerted too much chakra as some had disappeared, while the remainder of the clone strike force had sunk into the mud before dispersing themselves. Naruto's eyes slightly narrowed as he had received the memory from his clones and closed his eyes. This was going to take more than he anticipated, but just from his clone's memories, he had a few strategies devised within his mind. Jiraiya using that Doton had caused a frontal assault to become useless, except for a few feet in front of the Toad Sage. Naruto opened his eyes once more and grunted before summoning forty clones around him. Ten of you, go in front he muttered. The command proceeded as ten of the clones began the assault, and they charged toward the Sanin member. Naruto looked over at twelve of his clones nearest to him, and quickly told them the first plan. He heard multiple proofs as his first ten clones died out leaving an unharmed Jiraiya. He smirked slightly as he instructed another 18 to rush out. The large group headed out as they all held out their hands mid-sprint. Chakra and wind swirled into a single compact orb of rapidly rotating chakra. He had mastered the Rasengan with a clone in one week, why couldn't he do the same when performing and mastering it with one hand? As the multitude of Rasengan stabilized in their hands, they jumped over the swamp as they dove towards the long-haired man. Gureya made a couple hand signs before clapping his hands together. Inpo. Hari Jizo. His long hair lengthened to even greater lengths and then wrapped around his body. Every single hair follicle became charged with chakra, sharpening the strands as they shot outward like porcupine quills, hitting several of the aerial clones which all had dispersed. A plume of smoke indicating they had indeed disappeared. He stared at Naruto and frowned, you're going to have to try a lot harder to get me to talk Gaki. He paused in his speech before he noticed something completely off with the Kage Bunshin army. Last he had checked there were 12 clones plus Naruto in front of him, now there were only three. Where did the other ten go? He thought. His eyes widened as he heard the ground crumble below him as a clone shot upward from the rocky earth, its fist aiming up at Jiraiya's chin. The Sanin moved a foot back, dodging the rising fist, and quickly raising his leg up, he slammed it into the clone's ribs, sending it into the distance as it exploded into smoke upon impacting with a tree. He quickly heard multiple sounds of burrowing from the ground, as four clones from each side of him launched out of the ground, preparing to bring hell to the Gama Sanin. Jiraiya shifted into a stance with his palms positioned at his hips and his right leg placed behind his left. Twisting his body at the hip, he lashed out with a palm strike, resulting in him facepumming one of the clones. 
He then spun around and slammed his elbow into the stomach of another Kage Bunshin. Backflipping, the Sandin member avoided the double axe kick strike from the other two that had emerged from the ground as members of the four man underground assault. Jiraiya then landed in a handstand as he saw the clones continue their charge. Showing great skill, Jiraiya parried away their punches and kicks with his legs and feet alone. A two punch assault aimed for his spine was formed, but Jiraiya once again parried the blows, sending them to either side of him. After that, he began to rotate on his hands, lashing out with a brutal whirlwind of kicks to the clone's skulls. The first three consecutive kicks already brought an end to the stronger clones. Sensing movement near him, Jiraiya stopped spinning and bent his arms at the elbow so that he would be able to push off. As he did that, he twisted in midair and performed two straight kicks. Each kick hitting a single clone in the face. As those two clones dispersed, the white-haired man took out a kunai and collided his blade with another Kagabunshin's. He then moved aside the shorter male in order to duck beneath the diving clone that aimed to crash into his skull, stabbing said clone in the stomach as it appeared overhead. As he did that, he kicked the kunai-wielding clone in the stomach before throwing his kunai at it, impaling it through the chest. As the clones died, Jiraiya noticed one more clone came out of the ground. Only this time with a Rasengan in hand. The clone was only a few feet from the elite shinobi, his chakra sphere reared back, and he thrusted it forward aiming it directly at the man's sternum. Jiraiya narrowed his eyes at the closeness of the sphere, only being a few mere inches from his chest. Though his eyes could see the ball clear as day, the boy was fast, but he had to be a lot faster to provoke him to such an extent. He raised his arm and snuck it within the Kagabunshin's guard before striking the Rasengan holding arm, diverting the attack. The clone's eyes widened as it neared the ground only for Jiraiya to grab it and turn it around, so it faced him once more. The white-haired sage grabbed the clone's wrist as he shifted the attack towards the clone's gut, reversing the Rasengan completely as it shredded the clone's flesh. In a plume of smoke, the Kage Bunshin was defeated. He raised his head as he looked back, the boy was using tactics with his clones to see what weak spots were open, and thus when the time was right, he would send out the clones that were hidden, after the others failed to do so. This was nothing like he had seen from Naruto after noticing the boy's personality. The boy was dumb, but was that all a farce, a facade to simply let people believe he was this dumb boy, who in truth was intelligent in his own way. For a slight moment he had regretted not properly training the boy right if he was actually like this, as well as learning battle tactics. The sound of feet rushing came to his ears as he turned back seeing the boy and his clones coming to battle. What battle strategy had he planned this time? Blue eyes with vertical slits for pupils burned with anger as the blondes rushed out towards Jiraiya and they shot into the air. Just as Jiraiya came to prepare himself for the battle, his eyebrows rose in surprise as the clones smirked. They made a simple hand sign, the basic ninjutsu sign for Ram. Smoke enveloped them, and then from out of the clouds came three near-naked blonde females. Warwick no Jutsu the clone said as they winked at Jiraiya, causing the white-haired man to go wide-eyed and have a bloody nose. The distraction had succeeded as the clone narrowed its eyes, launching a deadly kick into Jiraiya's face, sending the man falling backwards. The clone disappeared in smoke, and within that smoke was a glowing blue light which blew the smoke away, as a sexy clone had completed forming a Rasengan into the female transformed Naruto's hand, which closed in at Jiraiya's sternum. Warwick Rasengan. Naruto said, slamming the jutsu into Jiraiya as the man fell back. The jutsu caused an explosion as it laid a large amount of smoke and debris in the area. Naruto came out, no longer in his female transformation as he landed across from the blast site just a few yards away. He studied the smoke pile, waiting, he knew that the attack wouldn't take down Jiraiya. The man wasn't a Sanin for nothing. He was a Kage-level ninja, a powerhouse. A simple technique like that wouldn't defeat him. It was only a few brief moments before Jiraiya's shadow stood in the debris, once it cleared up it showed the man with little to no harm on him, his clothes, namely the chest area. Had a circular hole in it from the Rasengan, with a noticeable swirl-shaped burn mark there as well, while the rest of his attire had only a little amount of tearing. His eyes showed a hard exterior to them as he frowned at Naruto. Okay, if that's how you want to play Naruto then I will do that, but you're going to regret it, Naruto. This was no easy Jiraiya, this was the man who was going to give the boy his just desserts. He made hand signs as he inhaled air into his lungs. Pain. Endon. A large fireball shot out from the man's mouth as it hurtled towards the blonde shinobi. Our favorite blonde's eyes widened slightly as he rushed many yards back to avoid the oncoming attack, preparing to dodge to his left. Though he felt heat coming towards that side as he looked quickly and noticed a second fireball on its way toward him. A slight brink of panic entered Naruto as he gritted his teeth. Naruto. Kamina called out from within his mind as he raised his eyes, manipulate the wind around you in a counterclockwise direction, it will become a vacuum in the air and absorb the oxygen from the flames, do it now. The Raiju yelled. 
Naruto quickly did as he was told, felt the wind around his hands and felt it quickly spinning. He maneuvered it a little as he could feel it reversing into the opposite direction. Once the flames drew close enough he pressed his hands onto the flames, his hands feeling the heat, but luckily not being burned from the fires, as the swirling winds in his hand quickly absorbed the both of the fireball's oxygen, killing the attacks in an instant. The blonde grunted a little as he shook a little, he wasn't used to manipulating the storm elements yet, but he was getting the hang of it. He saw Jiraiya giving a surprised look, a slight grin came upon his face as he wiped sweat from his brow. How did you do that? Jiraiya asked, hoping to get an answer from his godson. It was unnatural for someone to do that unless they had a great grasp of fire manipulation, though it seemed like it was wind that was coming from the flames, yet wind was fire's opposite, the wind would strengthen flames to such a great extent. Yet the wind had killed the flames. Did the blonde have a great grasp of wind elemental manipulation and keep it a secret? Naruto closed his eyes as he began to channel some of his chakra into his hand, lightning chakra had formed into a spherical shape in his hand. Once he closed his hand a sort of lightning the length of his arm came into view. His eyes opened once more as they became serious, a coldness to them. He pointed the lightning sword at his sensei and frowned. If you want to know, you're going to tie me and sit my ass on the ground if you want what's coming out of my mouth. Naruto said as he rushed out swinging the Kadachi length blade of lightning at the white haired man, coming at him with his attacks aiming at areas to disable the man, such as the joints or nerve areas to cause temporary paralysis. Each strike came smooth and quick, yet all were dodged. Once Naruto drew in close, it soon became the greatest mistake as the back of Jiraiya's hand smacked across Naruto's face, sending the blonde to the ground a few feet from him, and quickly stopped the lightning chakra natured sword from the boy's hands. Naruto grunted as he slowly got up, but he was grabbed by his hair as he was picked up and hanging almost two feet in the air. He grunted as he swung his feet around and growled, shifting his body around as he stared at Jiraiya with angry eyes. Eyes that had quickly returned to their crimson state. He received a quick punch from the senin and gasped out in pain, feeling a few of his ribs pop from the pressure of the blow. A second blow came, and Naruto could feel that his ribs were greatly bruised up from the pressure of the second punch, his stomach must have been too due to the slight amount of blood coming from his mouth. Three blows overall had left his body sore and in pain. This was Jiraiya's strength, and Naruto felt he wasn't even going all out for his sake and the man's own. Naruto could feel QB's healing come through, but it wasn't coming as quick as it should be when he gained extra amounts of the beast's chakra. Perhaps it was still due to Kamina restraining his chakra. He had to make this quick and fast, he could see Jiraiya coming for a fourth punch, but Naruto quickly reacted as he put chakra into his fingertips, which they slowly manipulated into sharp claws. He slashed at Jiraiya's forearm, causing the man to release the grip on his hair, as four vertical slash marks came onto his arm that was wounded. Now's my chance Naruto leaped a few yards back, building up chakra in his body. He raised his hands up as he put his hands together, and slowly the chakra was coming into his hands. He had a week of training from Kamina and honing his skills on his tajutsu, he wasn't going to give up without pulling out one of his few new tricks. Kamina could feel the gathering of Naruto's chakra and widened slightly at the feeling and looked around. Naruto, are you crazy you foolish boy? Slammed his fist into the ground of Naruto's mindscape. You don't have control of that technique yet, you're always out of sync with it. Do you not realize the repercussions in doing that attack? It will backfire. He told the boy from within his mind, what makes you think a week of manipulation and learning the basics of that move will make you completely control it. Naruto focused the energy in his hands and gave a slight chuckle, Kamina, you're in my mind, you've seen my memories you should know well enough by now that I'm a ninja who is unpredictable, one who takes things beyond the limit, his hands glowed a slight blue hue, as he grinned I make the impossible absolutely possible. Ride you arc. Shotenjuke. He yelled as he sent his hands into a downward motion which came to a halt near his chest. An abrupt power had surged through the blonde's hands as blue wind, mixed with lightning came out of the intertwined hands, the azure tornado charged forward toward the legendary toad sage, as it grew slightly larger, and the rotation speed began to increase. Jiraiya's eyes widened as he saw the attack come with great speed. He could feel the power of chakra emanating from the attack, and he knew it was a dangerous attack, a high B-rank jutsu, probably A-ranked. He pulled out a sheet of paper that had the kanji for barrier on it. He threw it in front of him as he made hand signs. Yunjutsu. Chakra Kekai. His chakra pushed into the seal as it surrounded it like a dome. As the attack struck the defensive Yunjutsu, a large shock wave formed at the point of impact. Slight cracks appeared on the barrier before the attack died down, leaving the barrier looking like it had just been on the verge of shattering. Song end. Ureya made haste as he gathered more chakra into the barrier, the crack slowly reverting away and leaving the barrier as if it was brand new. He held a deep thought in his mind as the barrier slowly began to die down. 
I've never seen an attack like that one before, it was as if it was a collaboration jutsu, but even if it was one it would be impossible for one person to do so by himself. He looked over to the blonde as he released the barrier and put the piece of paper back into his pouch. How did he get such a technique, was it a lost art from the Uzumaki? Did he find a scroll which held that technique? So many things didn't add up now in the man's mind. Naruto took in heavy breaths as he felt his chakra recede back into his body, he took a step forward before dropping down to one knee. He was breathing heavily this time as he looked at Jiraiya. I was in sync but I didn't have proper control of what amount of chakra to use, it caused me to exert more than I should have put out. The blonde thought as he tried to get up, though his body grew weaker and began to give up on him, wanting rest. Guzo was the last thought on his mind before falling face first onto the ground, roaming into a deep sleep. Amina chuckled in the boy's mind as it died down before saying a few words to the boy in his sleeping state. I guess you are indeed an unpredictable boy I guess you are more interesting than you make up to be. Gureya walked over to the boy and stared upon the sleeping blonde. He sighed softly as he grabbed him with his uninjured arm by the waist and carried him up towards the camp, their battle having resulted in them moving away from it. His eyes furrowed as he was lost in deep thought, the boy was deeply angry, fighting him had proved it, all in order to force what he could get out of Jiraiya. The blonde shinobi had every right to be mad, and he was going to bring hell once he was awake, which Jiraiya knew well if this boy had all of his mother's traits in him. The white-haired man knew whether he liked it or not, it was time for the blonde to know about his heritage, his mother's side for now. He knew though that after this Naruto wouldn't be the same around him, nor would he have such trust in him either. And that was going to be the hard part to bear during the next year and nine months. Six hours later. But in his mind, Naruto had stirred as he opened his eyes. Feeling tired but refreshed after burning the majority of his chakra into one attack. He groaned as he rubbed his head. Glancing around he settled his gaze upon Kamina as the Raiju gave him a slightly worried look, but at the same time a stern look as well as if from a teacher or parent disappointed in a child's actions. Naruto closed his eyes and got up as he stared up at the fox hybrid deity and lowered his head. I know, you told me not to use any of the abilities of the Raiju arc, even using that attack. Naruto quickly looked up as he frowned, though you don't know what it is like, I don't know who my parents are. Yet when I found out that I had family here I was ecstatic, but mad because they were all gone or most of them at least, and that people in Konoha, no, most of the older shinobi knew that I had family and denied telling me anything. I've been robbed by my right to know who my family was. He said. Hamina stared at Naruto and lowered his head down to the boy's level, I know boy, I know very well. I've seen many things in all my life, I've lived longer than many creatures on this planet. Possibly more than half of the existing human population combined, and I've seen the damage and the pain that all humans have done to one another during the shinobi era, you aren't the only one who felt such loss and betrayed by his own people he believed in. I'm not the only immortal who has seen this. All few of us there are, we are still here watching over in silence, and while the majority of us do not intervene, I felt it was time that I do so he said to the blonde. Naruto lowered his eyes in disappointment as he sighed, yeah. But I screwed up big time, I didn't take heed to your words, and I couldn't control myself into using the attack. He said. Kamina's large hand pressed onto Naruto's head as he gave a slight grin. I know I'm not making a mistake in putting my trust in your power yourself. You have good in you boy, but you need to listen to me when it comes to controlling your power, otherwise if I wasn't sure I wouldn't have given you your bloodline, and I would have not come across you if your actions weren't true to your words. The beast stood upright and looked down upon the human boy. Never doubt yourself Naruto, your faith is always stronger than your anger, and with your faith and actions of positive nature, you will no doubt change anyone you come across and change the future of the shinobi nations. He said to Naruto. Naruto smiled at Raiju's words before he shook his head and began looking around. By the way, why isn't QB saying anything, you two either make fun of me, chat discreetly, or argue with each other. Oh, the runt. Kamina looked over to the cage, seeing the crimson orange fox leap heavily in his cage as his ears twitched slightly. Kurama went to sleep right after you passed out, he was bored seeing that your little dispute between you and your master had come to an end, aside from that he was getting a headache from my chakra conflicting with his own. Kamina said. Naruto snickered in return, got a low sleeping growl from Kurama, and looked back at Kamina. So, what am I going to tell Jiraiya? He's going to want some answers from me after using Shotenjikiha on him. Simple, tell him Naruto widened his eyes slightly, there's no more point in denying him the truth anymore, just as much as there is no point in denying the real you. This facade is going to have to end with being a half-ass moron. It's time for people to accept responsibility for you as well as yourself to accept you for whom you really are. 
Tamina smirked, as long as you make things easy for them, they'll just get away with doing things. You need to take charge with life and push forward. Serious action will push your drive in being the strongest at the same time making life as enjoyable as possible. Iraju gave a grin of wit birth, showing wild canines. Take this advice from an ancient being older than the QP, I have much wisdom to offer. As much as perverted antics. Naruto asked receiving narrowed eyes in return. Don't tempt me, Naruto Kamina said, lightning flickering around his form. Naruto chuckled nervously as the Raiju raised his hand. Now wake up. Naruto blinked in confusion as Kamina flicked him on the forehead. However, the force behind the finger flick was similar to the one when he was hit by Tsuna Day, damn that woman hits hard, and he was forced out of his mindscape and thus awakening him into reality. Naruto had jumped from the place in which he had awoken upon. The fresh heat of a campfire came and made his body feel like an oven roasted turkey. He grunted as he arched his back a little to sit up more comfortably. It was early morning, still somewhat dark out, but the sunrise was coming into play very soon. He looked back into the fire and then looked over to see Jiraiya, still awake. The man's eyes weren't tired, but his eyelids were slightly droopy. The man seemed to have been in that same position for hours from deep thought and watching the blonde. It was kind of creeping out Naruto slightly, but the thought let go as his eyes furrowed at the man. While he wasn't as freshly angry as he was hours ago, it didn't mean that the anger wasn't gone. No it was still there, kicking about like sparks in a dying flame which waited to die out or burn once more. Naruto the white-haired man paused as he closed his eyes and did the one thing that Naruto thought that he would do in his life. The man had bowed his head to the blonde, I'm sorry, I should have told you from the start about your heritage I felt it wasn't time for you to know of such knowledge until you were of proper shinobi ranking. Though seeing your skills as it is I wouldn't doubt that you've earned the knowledge as of now Jiraiya said. Naruto raised his eyes a little in surprise, quickly lowering them once more as he frowned. That's no excuse and it's not going to make things easier on you. He said as he looked at the man, I had the right to know such things from the day I was born, no one had the right to take that knowledge away from me, making me feel like I had nothing to begin with. That's not true Jiraiya looked up at him as he slowly sat down once more, if you had nothing to begin with, as of now I see a lot of things that you had. You have much of your mother's personality, her anger for example. Yet the more I see that serious look upon your face, it makes me see the face of your father, as if he was prepared for battle with nothing to lose. You had your parents in you the entire time even if they left you in the saddest way possible. Naruto's eyes were more focused in, calm and collective as he stared at the man. So the man did know his parents, but the way he said it made it clear that they were dead. You must have known my parents well to get a grasp of such details from just seeing me. Of course, they had made me your godfather after all he said receiving a cold glare from the boy, he frowned a bit, I know you are mad about that, but you must understand that I am a shinobi, a powerful one that has a duty to his village. I am a master spy with high amounts of information that is important for the Hokage to know, and for the safety of the village. As much as I wanted to try and raise you I couldn't put you at that risk as a child, while I'm gathering intelligence he said. Yet you could have taken me with you at a young age and trained me. You're my fucking godfather, you are supposed to have some damn responsibility to take care of me. The blonde narrowed his eyes, or at least came by to let me know who you were. Naruto turned to face the crackling flames of the campfire. I couldn't do three things at once Naruto, I can't train and raise you while I'm gathering information on Orochimaru and the Akatsuki organization that he was once in to ensure that your life isn't at risk. He told the blonde as he waved his hand briefly, I did take some responsibility, I bought that apartment complex for you for example when you were at a decent age, paid the rent of your home as old man Suratobi gave you a monthly allowance which half came from me and half came from your parents from when they died and passed down their money, scrolls, and items down to you. Naruto was quiet for a moment as he gave in. It seemed the pervert actually did do something for him, even if he wasn't there for him for the majority of his life. He was also getting some of his heritage to him money-wise at least. Yet that wasn't satisfying to him, not in the least. I suppose I have to thank you and Jiji for that though, that doesn't help the fact you knew my parents and never told me. He said as he pointed at the man, so start by telling me who my parents, my family. Everything. Gureya sighed as he closed his eyes, opening his black eyes to stare at the cold azure blue ones. Alright then though after this you better tell me everything as well, that power for starters. He said. In my opinion, I wouldn't tell Jack Squat to keep this kind of thing from me, since this seems like the situation where I deserve to know about my heritage with no bartering whatsoever. However seeing as how you give me no choice. Naruto sighed, rubbing his temples as he looked at the fire, and Jiraiya swore for a moment that he looked older, more like his father. Fine, I'll start without wasting any more time, then Naruto quickly replied as he frowned, I've been putting a damn mask on, everything that you thought about me being hyperactive and dumb was just a facade. 
I have high amounts of stamina, but my intelligence is something tricky, well my intelligence was limited due to my ostracized past as being what I am. I was a trickster in some ways, a good hint for example is my knack for pranks. I figured that I would make people think I was dumb, that I was reckless in order for me to get accepted as at least a village idiot, so I can be accepted more. In which case it had cost me being stuck in the academy for three years, failing three times, but it was worth it I suppose. All some people had accepted me before, I wanted to know people I wasn't something God-fearing. If I became a shinobi too early it would have given them a little more fear, I'm not the type of person to use such a tactic against people. The blonde grimace in disgust, yet at the same time it had cost me the lack of training from Kakashi, it made me an easy target for Sakura to try and take a hit on me, and it also cost me to lose to Sasuke at the Valley of the End. If I wasn't playing dumb, none of those things would have happened. Hiraya was surprised to say the least, the boy had played a major wild card in his life, and it was perfect for a shinobi skill, masking his true person, his true goal. He was a genius at hiding his intelligence and maturity, he took the ninja code to the exact level as it should be, as it was many years ago during the time Minato was a major leading role in the third shinobi war, and from those who took big parts in the second and first war, as history puts forth. That's quite impressive, mostly Anbu can do that, yet you've been doing it for god knows how many years. He rubbed his head before looking back at the kid. What about that collaboration jutsu, or that chakra sword in your hand? Oh, right Naruto sighed, shaking his head before he looked at him. Remember about a little over a week ago when we were in that hotel, you asked me if I was hurt because lightning struck the shoreline. Jiraiya nodded at the question, well, that wasn't lightning it was a raiju. Silence had consumed the area before Jiraiya gave out a barking laugh and fell backwards. Naruto sighed as ran his fingers through his hair. I knew something like that was going to happen somehow in my mind. I don't find his laughter amusing Kamina barked out in annoyance. Hiraya leaned forward once more, holding his laughter in once it receded inside him, so you're telling me that a thunder beast came down to you from lightning. Well he's not technically gone per se, he's more in the lines of inside my mind right now. He came inside my body by lightning and well, he's in there with QB Naruto simply said. Now Jiraiya was taking this seriously, hearing that it came down to him was one thing, but being in his mind was another. He had never even heard about thunder beasts being real until now, they were only supposed to be a myth. The loyal follower of Raijin, of all things ran through his mind. It sounded like a complete farce, but then again there were Bijuu unnatural beasts of chakra, but hearing that a real Raiju was inside the blonde ninja was just so much to process. Alright Raiju. In your mind. Okay. He rubbed his temples, so if he is in your mind, then how can you use lightning and wind? Well, he said that my chakra was unique to him, that's why he came inside my mind, because of my unique heritage, he gave me a bloodline. A bloodline to manipulate the elements of storms. I think that's lightning and wind, he says sometimes water, but that depends whether you're by any water landmarks or regions Kamina tells me. Naruto said the reason he's still inside me was so that he could train me to completely master the bloodline, so I could get a full grasp of its power. Gureya furrowed his eyes, processing everything he had heard. He would have to trust Naruto on his word alone, as well as the attack he had produced not long ago. He would have to find some way to make contact with the Raiju somehow, unless he would wait until they got back to Konoha to check Naruto for any mental disorders such as schizophrenia most likely, if he was hallucinating about some deity in his head and giving him powers. Though Naruto never lied to him and it felt so real now to know. I suppose he also gave you some ideal tojutsu skills to train with. He asked the blonde. Now that one Naruto would have to lie about. No offense to the fox, but Naruto would not hear the end of it from his godfather if he had got too different to Jutsu from QP's memories. Too much of an annoying situation if that were to in fact be the case. Yes, he said I'm a speed type, most of my skill sets rely on my agility, speed, and with my lean build, I can move faster and thus, strike harder. So he gave me two that would benefit me more than it would him. Naruto lied as he wanted to cut to the chase. He was giving a lot of information as it was, and it was irritating for him not to get all the answers that he wanted to hear. Alright, enough about that, I told you everything I know, now get on with what I have to hear from you. Gureya exhaled some air, much of the information he had gotten from the boy proved to have some worth. At least the boy was getting proper training from one other person, or mythical thunder beast in this case, than himself. It would be up to the man to teach Naruto Fuinjutsu before the boy would become a master on his own, and in addition to chakra training, resistance training and a little bit of ninjutsu before they came home. Half of the things Jiraiya needed to do were basically in the hands of Naruto's friend. Jiraiya had grabbed a stick and then began to draw on the sandy earth showing three symbols, a fan, a spiral, and a symbol that resembled a forest. For starters let me give you a brief detail I suppose. 
Before the elemental nations came to full existence there were two clans that were great rivals, the Senju and the Achiha. they were also considered to be one of the oldest clans of all the elemental nations, aside from two other clans, the Hyuga and the Uzumaki. He began to draw a circle around the three symbols. So far, from what I can tell, was that the Uzumaki clan, the Senju clan, and the Achiha clan, are very close to each other, meaning that they might have had a closer relationship in the past as far as I know of. However, blood-wise the Uzumaki clan and Senju clan are distant cousins of one another, though different, they hold quite the same amount of blood. So I'm related to Bachan in a sense Naruto cut in as he frowned, another reason to be irritated at people's lack of honesty. He had a feeling he was going to be irritated even more. Does she know? Most likely, she knew your mother, so it's obvious that your cousins through her grandmother. Her grandfather was the Shadame Hokage, her granduncle was the Nidame, her grandmother, the wife of Hashirama Senju was also an Uzumaki, as well as the first Jinchuriki of the QB no Yoko. He said to Naruto as he saw the blonde's wide reaction. Not many knew that, but old man Suritobi gave me information on past Jinchuriki for the sake of getting any information on what it would be like if you had control of QB's chakra. Though I think telling you that you should wait until you are more prepared, more trained. Out of you and the other Jinchuriki, Mito Uzumaki was the only one who had full control over the QB chakra before she died during the transfer process to make a new Jinchuriki. He said. The Kashina Uzumaki Naruto thought for a moment as he spoke, were there any other Uzumaki in Kanoha other than her? Aside from herself, no, from what little information we could gather quite few of the transport boats had survived the onslaught from Kumo and Kiri, while most of the veteran shinobi including the leader of the village, fought to protect the homeland. It was a long fight, but as you can see this was the result. Saying to Naruto as he looked around the ruined village. Far as I know, the clans that resided in the village and the handful of surviving Yuzumaki had either gone to the other major villages, changing their names, otherwise being scattered across the lands, forgetting their clan legacy. Kishina was no more than seven years old when she came to Konoha, your mother became the second Jinchuriki after shortly coming. Naruto lowered his eyes and closed his eyes, he figured the Kishina would have been his mother. It sounded so obvious, but he didn't want to simply accept that his mother was Jinchuriki as well, it hurt to know the outcome. As I said before, Yuzumakis are well known for their high stamina or longevity you could say, as well as their mastery of Fuinjutsu. Your mother was chosen to become the next host because Yuzumakis had long lives, so holding the QB for long periods of time kept people at ease for those who knew. Also that she possessed unique chakra, her chakra was able to suppress the chakra, such as a tailed beast as powerful as QB. Yet even as a Jinchuriki that never brought her down, it made her stronger. The old sage smiled slightly, the more I see your hyperactivity, the more I see her in you, just as well as the amount of stamina you carry. Your chakra itself is large even for an Yuzumaki, because you are a child of a Jinchuriki, but holding QB inside you gives you much more chakra than ever before. Alone, you could have Kage level reserves by the time we are done with your training. He said. Naruto gave a slight nod in understanding what he had meant. Of course being a Jinchuriki it gave him shitty chakra control, but adding that he was the child of one made things annoy him. Though he didn't mind, he was getting stronger because of it, it was thanks to his mother. Yet it made things dwell in Naruto's mind. A Jinchuriki can't survive an extraction so I think she's not here. He gave a sad smile, I want to know though was I worth her sacrifice. Being born I mean. Your mother had a strong seal on her, but a female Jinchuriki has a great weakness at one point of life, Naruto. And that is childbirth. It risks the release of the tailed beast during the time a female Jinchuriki goes into labor, so a seal master is there to make sure the seal is stabilized as the birthing comes into place. I don't know what happened, but the day you were born was the day QB was released, so I'm not sure if her seal failed or if she died during labor. But I do know this, Naruto. He told the boy as he gave a soft smile, that woman loved you more than anything, hell whenever I came to visit her and your father, she would always talk to you when you kicked or when you seemed restless in that fat belly of her. He laughed, though it quickly died down. If anything, her and your father's sacrifice to bring you to this world was more than worth it because they loved you very much to the very end. He said. Naruto smirked at that, so my Kachan was a Jinchuriki and my Tusan, a Kage, I think I can deal with it. Naruto shrugged, I suppose they did it for a good reason. Well of cool. Jiraiya stopped as his eyes went wide, popping out of their sockets as his eyes gazed upon the boy. H how did you know? He asked, his question followed by the sputtering of his lips, as he tried to comprehend how he managed to figure out his father's identity from all that. Iro Senen, I'm blonde, not stupid, no matter how I acted before. There are many reasons I know just by guessing. He held out four fingers and curled them down by order as he spoke the reasons. One, you said you knew both my Kachan and Tusan, and knowing that you know the only blonde with my kind of hair color and style is the Yandame Hokage. 
Two, he's the only seal master other than you and Kachan that was in the village, though you weren't there so it was up to him to do the seal checkups. Three, the Yandame Hokage sealed QP in me, I don't think he would be heartless to put it in a family or orphan child, it would have to be someone who was there, someone close. Lastly, it was ironic if the fact that Kachan married Yandame just as Mido married Shadame. He said getting up and patting his pants to get debris off. Riya simply blinked, stunned at the notion of reasons that his godson had put out. Well remarkable, it was rare for such things to cross anyone's mind. If anyone had thought like the boy just did, then everyone in the village would have seen him as was meant to be, a hero. Though life doesn't seem to go that way and it was sad to realize that, Jiraiya saw that Naruto would make a path for people to see things like that as clear as day. Baby. This kid is who I am looking for he thought before noticing the blonde leaving the campsite. The large man got up and looked at Naruto's back as he walked off. Where do you think you're going Gaki? He asked. Naruto simply shrugged and waved his hand, I'm going back to the ruin vault, I'm going to gather as much of everything in that room and seal them in storage scrolls. I feel it's my birthright to claim it just as much as it's my right to claim this my home that way history will never erase the Uzumaki clan and people will know that there are still remnants of the dead clan here today. Naruto looked back as he smirked, I'm making it my goal just as much as becoming Hokage and bringing duck ass home. I'm going to rebuild the Uzumaki clan, whether I have a family in the future, if I adopt anyone in, or even if I find other Uzumaki like me. I will bring them to Konoha, and when we flourish once more they will come back here and rebuild, thus beginning the cycle of the whirlpool once more. Naruto stopped before he looked back upon Jiraiya and smirked, and when I come back, there will be no more distractions, no more going easy. I want to put my training to the fullest in order to become strong for myself and those I care for, and to show that I am not the QB, but I am myself. I am Yuzumaki Naruto, no one else. Three months later. Waves moved through the ocean current past a ferry. The cool misty air seemed to keep the temperatures of early spring around the low 50s around the ocean. Naruto was leaning on the rail of the ship, his hair slightly longer in length, he was about a few inches taller as well, growing from 5'1 to 5'6. His muscle mass had built up somewhat as his biceps and triceps showed some slight tone definition in them, and some of the baby fat from his face had burned off. The blonde was wearing new threads compared to his jumpsuit. He wanted to honor his heritage, his family by wearing the Yuzumaki Stander Shinobi outfit, though he made some slight changes to them. He wore a sleeveless black and teal shirt with a black bandana around his neck, with a red Yuzumaki symbol showing. He also had a set of black pants and black sandals on to match his gear. On his back was a kadachi in which he found untouched in the vault hidden within many of the clothing and scrolls. The blade was black within a black sheath with a handle longer than a normal short sword. On the side of his pants were two kunai pouches, each holding a slim large black kunai, meant for close-range long-term battles and smaller ones for range. Overall, in the three months, his training was greatly worth it, but he still had much to go for. Most of his training with Jureya was honing his physical attributes, strength, chakra control, speed, and agility, which was still going with almost double the amount he had before. Along with learning few ninjutsu and learning a couple of ninjutsu. He had become an expert in a short time, and he had begun learning his affinities for the start of his elemental ninjutsu training. Surprisingly he had an affinity for wind as his primary element with lightning and fire as a secondary. He had asked Kamina why he never had water, all the raiju could say was that QB's affinity had overpowered his other secondary affinity. Though it didn't bother Naruto much, while well Jureya had taught him a couple Katen jutsu, Naruto had learned two Raiden and Futen jutsu from the scrolls left in the vault. He was thankful for that since when he had learned more about his heritage, he had found that most of the Uzumaki clan bore a water affinity with earth or lightning as secondary. They had little Katen users in the village, which was surprising to know since quite a lot of people held a Katen. Other than his training with Jureya, his training with Kamina had gotten him to great levels. He was able to sink in with his manipulation with wind and lightning and learn three of the ten attacks he was to learn for his bloodline. That training helped with much of his elemental manipulation for two out his three affinities. His skills with his tajutsu were growing just as much as his physical training. He was quite adept at using Hiryu Ken while Yase no Kitsune Ken, he was still in the process of learning. After all, one does not become a master of a tajutsu style overnight. His physical capabilities had increased tenfold, or so he had been told by his pervert of a sensei. Once he had those weights and seals off Yureya told him that he would be around Kakashi's level, the level of an elite jounin, within the next year. Naruto looked over to see Mizu no Kuni just a few hours away, he could hear Jiraiya talking to the female captain of the boat on what seemed like a new piece for his Icha Icha series. He sweat dropped as Jiraiya was suddenly kicked in the balls, sending him crumpling to the deck of the ship, with the captain releasing a cry of hentai. Turning away from his damaged teacher, Naruto stared back at one of the five great elemental nations. 
Once they get to Mizu no Kuni, Naruto would hope to expect more growth and development for him. As well as the wonders of what would Kurigaku be like after a couple years in being in a civil war. Naruto couldn't help but bear a fox grin on his face. The ship had let out a loud honk in order to notify its passengers that it had arrived at the dock of the hidden village of Mizu no Kuni. The captain stood at the side of the exit, waving goodbye to her passengers. However, as soon as Jiraiya had come up, she had launched an icy glare at him, causing him to bite his tongue in order to keep whatever perverted remark he had in store, for the attractive woman remained in his mind. A smirk of satisfaction graced the captain's features as the white-haired sage was silent before going back to her happy persona when Naruto and the other passengers followed after him. As soon as Naruto had walked over to Jiraiya, the master and apprentice had already begun their trek into Kuridakur no Sato streets. Naruto looked over the village itself as he and Jiraiya walked through it all. The village itself seemed a bit dark and gloomy, but that was most likely due to the large amounts of mist that coated the area, thus blocking a decent amount of sunlight. The buildings themselves were very amazing pieces of architecture which made up for the lack of viewing pleasure. A majority of the houses were basic one to two story houses for the civilians and or shinobi that resided within the area. But there were also many towering pieces of infrastructure that appeared to disappear into the clouds of mist that loomed high above the heads of the locals, as well as the foreigners that walked the streets of the ninja village. Though, true to its name of Mizu no Kuni, the capital of Kurigakur no Sato had many waterways flowing alongside the buildings in some areas. The water flowed beneath water wheels which were used to turn the gears of grinding mills, as well as, in a rather amazing show of innovative thinking, to turn a numerous amount of chakra conductive metal turbines, which were infused with lightning elemental seals to provide electrical energy, which was then distributed accordingly throughout the village hidden in the mist. As Naruto continued to marvel at the village, he remembered something which caused him to frown. Haku and Zabuza had lived here. The images of the two shinobi that caused him to change his entire perspective on shinobi livelihood and the development of his nindo crossed his mind before he turned to Jiraiya. Boy, Hirokaiofu. Naruto asked his godfather which, upon taking the information into consideration, had seen fit to change the nickname of his teacher from Hirosenin to the aforementioned one. Jiraiya's eye twitched at that, but seeing as how the boy wasn't really wrong in the naming of him, he had let it slide for the entirety of its usage. What, Gaki? Um. Naruto moved in a bit closer to his white-haired sensei, so as to whisper the words, is Inkiri supposed to be locked in some kind of civil war right now? The Mizukage and the Daimyo have been fighting for supremacy for a while, haven't they? Hiraya nodded, hi, but that civil war ended a few months ago. The Mizukage now rules over Kurigakur no Sato, but in a show of good nature, the Mizukage had decided to give the Daimyo a more than satisfactory amount of control over the trade industry, which is what gives Kurigakur the primary amount of its revenue aside from tourism. After all, these buildings don't build themselves. He gestured to the towering skyscrapers of the village. Naruto nodded in understanding. So, why are we here anyway? This place is way too populated for us to take part in any training whatsoever, unless you came here just so you research on the bathhouses of Kiri. Naruto deadpanned. Jiraiya chuckled and ruffled the hair of his godson. Now, now my young pupil. Do you think so little of my reasoning to come here? He spoke with mock hurt. Although I must admit that doing some research here wouldn't be a bad idea. Jiraiya mused before giving a serious look at the blonde Jinchiriki. But the real reason we are here is because Kurigakur is holding the Chunin exams this year, and you are no doubt above Chunin level in terms of your skill, so I thought why not get you a suitable ranking to go with your skills. Jiraiya said, causing Naruto's eyes to widen. Are are really? The Chunin exams. Here. Now. He asked with excitement. Jiraiya nodded. Yup, but first we have to head over to the Mizuka Gaze Tower to sign you up. We're kind of a late entry. Naruto's eyes narrowed before turning to face his perverted sensei. How late are we talking, Iro Kaiofu? Jiraiya rubbed the back of his head sheepishly. Um. We kind of only have one week to prepare before the actual thing starts. He said with a nervous chuckle. Naruto's eyes widened, nearly bugging out of his head. One week you got be fucking kidding me he yelled. Jiraiya waved his hands in a defensive manner. Now hold on, the training I did with you is more than enough for you to do the exam, but don't worry, you have your shinobi passport, so we can be recognized as legally being within Kurigakur. Well before we go to the Mizuka Gaze Tower we should drop our stuff off at the hotel I booked us in. Naruto nodded in agreement as he followed his sensei to the hotel, which was another member of the tall buildings that lay amongst the throng of already freakishly tall buildings. The hotel was rather simple looking, relatively tall and strong looking despite it being a hotel building. It had a numerous number of windows, about three windows and twenty rows to represent the twenty floors that made up the hotel, and there were a few small balconies present on floors fifteen to twenty. 
There was no specific name for the hotel, but the neon sign shone brightly through the mist, with the single word hotel being present in a bright indigo color. Hiraya and Naruto entered the hotel before walking up to the front desk. The young man that stood behind the front desk gave a friendly smile and bowed to the two new entries of the hotel. Good morning gentlemen. The man spoke in a polite tone before standing straight once more. I am the concierge of this establishment, Takayama. How may I help you? Takayama-san, my pupil and I require a single room with two beds please. Any floor is fine, we're not picky. Jiraiya said with an equally polite tone to the concierge. Takayama nodded before going through the log book in front of him before looking up with a small smile. It appears we have a couple rooms containing what you like. The 4th, 7th, 8th and 10th floors contain one room each with two beds. Which floor would you like? He asked, I would recommend the 10th floor room. There are two bathrooms in that one. That sealed the deal for the two shinobi as they slammed their hands on the desk. We'll take it. They said loudly. Takayama sweat dropped at their eagerness to take the room before nodding and handing them the key. Their room number is 1009. We hope you enjoy your stay here in our hotel and in Kuridakur no Sato, by extension. Takayama bowed once more as Naruto and Jiraiya bowed in reply. Thank you, Takayama-san. Naruto and Jiraiya spoke before heading towards the staircase. Climbing the stairs to the 10th floor, Naruto and Jiraiya followed the lengthy hallway towards the room, 1009. Jiraiya took the key out of his pocket before inserting it into the lock and entering the room. The two males entered and surveyed their temporary living quarters they would be using for the entirety of their stay in Kiri. The room was rather plain, much like the one Naruto and Jiraiya had stayed at when they went to look for Tsunade. A large sliding window that granted them a view of the streets below. There were two queen-size beds and a single side table placed in between both beds, which had a pair of lamps placed atop it. A clock hung on the wall showing the time to be almost noon. The two bathrooms were located opposite each bed. The beds are much more comfy than I thought they would be. Naruto thought as he had plopped himself down upon said bed. Jiraiya and Naruto rested their bags on their respective beds before Naruto decided to go use the bathroom as Jiraiya began to check through his supplies for when he and Naruto had to go to the Mizuka Gaze quarters to register for the Chunin exams. Boy, Irokai Ofu Naruto yelled from the porcelain throne. Jiraiya sweat dropped at his godson having to call him out from the bathroom of all places. Yes Naruto. Just out of curiosity, what are the rules for the Chunin exams here in Kurigakur, because I doubt it will be anything similar to that of Konoha's. Naruto said. Jiraiya nodded in agreement. Well that is true, but the only way to find out what exactly they will be doing for the Chunin exams this year is to take part in them. Or at least be an examiner of the Mizuka Gay. However, the only rule I remember being common in all Chunin exams is that you have permission to kill. The Gama Senen replied. The sound of the toilet flushing was heard, and in a few seconds after washing his hands, Naruto emerged from the bathroom with a frown on his face. So. I'm guessing there will be a few people like that Anko lady who are sadistic bitches in the exam. Jiraiya laughed at his student's serious tone before nodding. Most likely, but damn gaki. Does Anko-chan really scare you? It's not that she scares me, Iro Kaiofu. It's just that she's really, really creepy. I mean she licked my frickin' blood. He waved his arms around for emphasis. Jiraiya ruffled his student's hair. It's okay, Gaki. Now then. The Toad Sage gained a serious look upon his face, I have to admit that there will be a problem getting you into the exams, because only three-man teams are allowed to enter the exam, just like in Kanoha. So the problem lies in where to get you two other teammates. Naruto and Jiraiya stared at one another with thoughtful gazes only for Naruto to suddenly break out into his infamous foxy grin. Alright, Gaki. Jiraiya spoke with a sigh, what is going on in that little head of yours? Irokaiofu. I don't why you even see this as a problem. You're talking to a prank master who has Kage Bunshin and Henge at his disposal. Jiraiya blinked at the blonde in confusion before his eyes widened in realization. Daki. You evil little genius you. Naruto's grin increased in size. Who claimed blondes were idiots? The large cylindrical tower stood before them. The tower itself appeared to be made of strong concrete and probably had wood and steel used for supporting the gargantuan structure. The tower looked to be a good 10 feet taller than the Hokage Tower back in Kanoha. It was painted with a deep ocean blue color and wide in an upward swirling pattern, making it look like the tower was made of a raging whirlpool. The kanji for water was placed in the center of a giant red circle, which lay on the tower, with the symbol for Kurigakur laying on the arch that was above the doorway that led into the tower. Said symbol being the four wavy lines that were found on the hit I ate of each Kurigakur shinobi. So this is the Mizuka Gaze Tower, huh? Naruto stared up at the towering architectural marvel. Yup. Jiraiya replied. Now come on, let's get you into those Chunin exams. He knocked on the door, its steel construction causing it to release a hollow clang with each knock. 
Suddenly a slot slid open, allowing for a pair of dark colored eyes to peer through the door. Who is this? The owner of the pair of eyes spoke with a baritone, glaring at the two foreign ninja. I am Jiraiya, member of the San and no Konoha. I'm here to sign my students up for this year's Chunin exams. Jiraiya explained as he gestured to Naruto. As the eyes turned to look at Naruto, two other figures suddenly appeared beside him. The first figure was a young boy around Naruto's age, with straight dark blue hair and had two white vertical highlights. He had pale skin and electric blue eyes. The boy wore a dark blue vest over a black long-sleeved shirt and a pair of black pants and sandals. His build was rather muscular, but not so much that he would be registered as a bodybuilder. A katana was strapped to the boy's back. The second figure was another young male who looked the same age as Naruto as well. He had crimson-colored hair and matching eyes. Said eyes had dark black rings outlining them that would remind one of Gara's eyes and had a large grin present on his face, which allowed one to see the abnormally sharp canines present in his mouth. The red-haired boy wore a red shirt with black sleeves and a pair of crimson pants and black shinobi sandals. His build was similar to that of Naruto's, thus showing that this boy was built for speed, not power unlike his blue-haired counterpart. The two shinobi and Naruto all whipped out their passports to verify their identities. I'm Yuzumaki Naruto and these are my teammates. Kamina. He gestured to the blue-haired boy and Kurama. He directed his hand towards the red-haired teammate of his. The dark-colored eyes narrowed as they surveyed the passports closely before a slight movement showed that the person had nodded. Very well, you may enter Mizukage-sama's dwelling. Jiraiya-sama, you and your pupils may pass through. The slot then closed and the door opened revealing the guard of the door. Naruto, Kamina and Kurama all stared in awe at the large man who towered over them. Despite Jiraiya having a towering height of 6'2", this person was a good 5 inches over Jiraiya's head. A pale-skinned man who appeared to be rather lanky, but to the trained eye, one could see the tension in his muscles. He wore a standard Jounin uniform for Karigakur no Sado and had his hit I-8 wrapped around his left bicep. Come, I shall lead you to Mizuka Gaysama's quarters. The man spoke before closing the door as soon as they had entered. Climbing the spiral staircase, the two Kanoha shinobi followed their Kiri escort up to the top floor of the tower. Upon reaching said floor, the lanky man led Jiraiya, Naruto and his two other pupils, a rather plain-looking door with a golden doorknob. The man turned to the Kanoha ninja and took out a small scroll and opened it out. A storage scroll? Naruto asked, raising an eyebrow. Hi. As you are not fully trusted within the village, I ask that you, your teammates as well as Jiraiya-sama, leave your weapons inside this scroll for obvious reasons. Jiraiya nodded and Naruto and his teammates followed suit. Kamina, Kurama and Naruto removed their blades, while Jiraiya only took away his weapons pouch, as well as Naruto's. After the items were sealed away, Jen pocketed the scroll. Your items will be returned after your meeting with Mizuka Gaysama. The gatekeeper of the Kage Tower spoke. The man raised his hand and knocked three times. Enter. A muffled voice spoke. The man turned the doorknob and pushed it open, allowing the Kanoha Shinobi the chance to gaze at the office of the Mizuka Gay. It was very much like the Hokage's office in which it was quite large. There was a large set of windows behind the large wooden desk, which seemed to be coated with a surprising amount of paperwork. There was a rather large bookcase filled to the brim with scrolls regarding things such as politics, strategy, and it was likely there may have been a jutsu scroll hidden amongst the cylindrical object storage unit. Behind the desk was a beautiful red leather chair with an even more beautiful woman resting herself in said chair. The woman was very beautiful, some might even claim her to be a goddess in human form. She had a very shapely form for as she stood to her feet, Jiraiya was quick to scan her from her lean face, her large breasts and wide hips, and had to hold back the nosebleed when a very long leg was visible through the slit in the woman's dark blue dress. Said dress only began midway at her breasts, but the rest of her mounts were covered by a mesh undershirt. The woman had red oxide colored hair that was very long that extended well past her shoulders, and some managed to cover one of her dark colored eyes. She had cream colored skin and wore dark blue lipstick. A set of dark blue, high heel shoes were worn on her feet, but if it weren't for the large dark blue and white hat that rested atop her head, one would not have even suspected this amazing specimen of the female populace to be the Mizukage of Karigakur no Sado, Terumi Mei. Next to the Mizukage was a tall, middle-aged man who wore what looked like a hunter nin's outfit. Looks like Hakus. Naruto observed. The qua-colored robes were worn over a dark green turtleneck and matching pants, which were visible since the battle kimono only covered from his collarbone to the middle of his lower leg area. A pair of dark blue sandals was worn on the man's feet. His blue hair was slicked upwards, and his kiri hit I-8 was worn around his forehead. His tanned skin was slightly wrinkled, and an eye patch covered his left eye, while the brown iris of his right eye glared at the Kanoha ninja. This was Ao, Mei's bodyguard and a member of the Karigakur Anbu Hunter Nin Corps. Jen, is something the matter? 
The Mizuka Gay asked as she looked at her tower's bodyguard. No, Mizuka Gay sama. The man knelt upon entering the room. My apologies for intruding so abruptly as I know you are busy with the paperwork for the Chunin exams, but it appears that your Ayasama of the Sanin no Konoha and a trio of Genin have come to take part in the exams as well. Jen rose up and gestured to the Gama Senin and his Genin trio. I see. Thank you Jen. You may leave. Mei spoke with a nod of her head. Jen rose up to his feet, bowed once more, and left the room, ducking his head in order to avoid being hit by the upper part of the doorframe. As Jen left, Mei and Ao turned their attention to the Konoha shinobi. Hello, Jiraiya-san. Bazooka Gay-sama. Jiraiya spoke with a respectful tone. Despite his perverted mindset, he knew when to be himself and when to be serious. Mizuka Gay-sama, as your gatekeeper had stated before, my apprentice, Naruto Uzumaki and his two teammates. Jiraiya turned back to the three and earned himself a sly wink from the blonde, they are here to enter your village's Junin examinations. Since this is a rather late entry I thought it would be best to notify you of this. Mei nodded before turning to Ao. Ao-san, please run a scan of our guests to see if they decided to go against Jen Sen's wishes of handing over their weapons prior to entering in my presence. Ao nodded before holding up one hand and activated his sensory abilities. Ao-san is a member of the Anbu Hunter Nin Corps and one of, if not the best sensory type shinobi in Kiri. Hence why he is now my personal bodyguard. Mei explained as she gave a sweet smile. Ao cancelled his chakra usage and then asked the Kanoha shinobi to see their ID passports. Upon looking at them, he verified that they were authentic before he turned to his superior. Mizuka Gay sama they don't have anything that would harm you. Personally, I don't really see why they would want to harm you, you are a Kage and so. As Ao continued his rant, the Mizuka Gay only focused on specific words in her bodyguard's dialogue. They. Want. You. These words were prominent in her mind, and so the red-haired Kage turned and gave Ao a sickeningly sweet smile. Ao. Shut up or I'll kill you. The eyepatch-wearing man's eye widened in surprise. Nani. Again, what did I do? This always happens. He thought. Naruto, Kamina and Karama all sweat-dropped while Jiraiya remained impassive, but in the end they couldn't help but feel a sense of foreboding towards the powerful shinobi before them. Alright, Jiraiya-sama. You and your genin team are free to enter our Chunin exams. The first exam will take place in one week, so I suggest you prepare your students well as people tend to die frequently in these exams. Mei said. Thank you for the advice, Mizuka Gay-sama. Jiraiya bowed before turning to Naruto and his two teammates. Come on, Naruto. You three need to train and prepare for this one week. A simultaneous nod was done by all three boys before they followed Jiraiya outside of the office. Once the door closed behind them, Ao turned to Mei. Azuka gay sama there is something off about those three genin, should I pursue them? No ow. Everything is off about shinobi and if we went by every single off feeling we had, then we'd basically be killing every single ambassador and liaison that enters our borders. Besides. She smiled at ow, the blonde one looks like he'll give us a show during the course of these exams. Streets of Kurigakur. As Jiraiya, Naruto, Kamina and Kurama received their supplies back from Jen, they immediately headed back to the hotel. Once they entered the room, Kamina and Kurama, as well as their passports, exploded into plumes of smoke, revealing them to be Naruto's Kagabunshin. Gee boss, could you cut it closer next time? I swear that our guy could see right through the hinge. Kamina spoke. I agree. Kurama and the other Naruto clones chorused. Oh come, do you really think that we could get caught? Naruto asked. The woman was a Kage, and she said that the other guy was the best sensory shinobi they had. Kamina and Kurama gave their creator a flat stare. Naruto stared at his clones, who raised their eyebrows, as if they were waiting for some reply from their creator. Just shut up. Naruto said as he made a hand sign and the clones all dispelled in simultaneous plumes of smoke. See, I told you we could get through with it, Iro Kaiofu. Hi, hi. Though I must ask, just how good are you that you are able to make an Anbu unwary of your teammates and their identification cards? Iro Kaiofu, when you've spent your entire childhood pranking and getting the ability to go into the woman's side of the hot springs under the guise of henge with a female shinobi and said hot spring. That is how good I am. Of course, first few times I got my ass kicked for getting caught. Jiraiya hugged his student. The pervert is strong with this one. The white-haired man said with tears of joy running down his face. I'm so proud of you, my godson. Iris I, Iro Kaiofu. Seriously, I think you're soaking my hair. Naruto pushed the older man away, and the toad sage wiped his tears. So what's the training agenda? By the way, does Bachan know about my partaking in this Junin exams? Did she even consent? Hiraya chuckled, well, in that order, I plan on just having you do some work with your elemental ninjutsu and work on your few ninjutsu a little bit more. 
Plus you said that you were still working with that Raiju of yours on some new jutsus, so you can do that. Plus, I also aim to have you read some scrolls relating to politics during the week of training, because if you say you want to be Hokage, you're going to have to learn that kind of stuff. You have Kage bunch and no jutsu, so you'll be able to split up the work evenly. Secondly, yes Tsuna Dane knows I was letting you partake in this Chunin exams, however she said that none of the genin from your year will be taking place this year, because, well, it's only been 6 months Gaki, and I doubt your friends were able to increase in strength at the rate you're at to be ready for a Chunin exams, I mean seriously. None of them have the ability to make hundreds of clones and be able to learn multiple things at the same time. Thirdly, my reply just answered your third, Tsunade consented, but she said that she would be unable to spare any genin for you to act as your teammates, which is why I said it would have been trouble to get you a three-man team. Oh. Naruto replied intelligently. Do you want to start now or later, Gaki? The white-haired senin asked. The blonde then held up his hands in a cross-shaped hand sign and grinned widely. Age Bunshin no Jutsu. Jiraiya sighed as he saw the room was filled with about 50 replicas of the blonde genin. You know, you could have just said yes or no. Oh, where's the fun in that, Hirokaiofu? One week later Karigakur Chunin examination. Naruto had recreated his clones in the likeness of his teammates from yesterday. Kamina and Kurama then stretched their limbs as they stood beside their creator, ready to go into the first act of the Chunin exams of Karigakur no Sato. So boss, do you think we'll be ready for this? Kurama asked. Why are you asking this? You're me, so you should know the answer to that. The blonde replied to his red-haired teammate. Oh yeah, right. The red-haired boy chuckled sheepishly. Kamina shook his head at his fellow clone before surveying the area. Though, I must say boss. Kurama has a point in asking, I mean just look at how many people are in this thing. Naruto looked around and frowned as he realized Kurama and Kamina did have a bit of a point in their asking. There were over 100 teams taking part, and all of them had that look that said how they would be willing to do whatever it took to gain the promotion to Chunin. Do bad, I'll be the one getting in their way. The blonde grinned like the QB within him. Mind lopping a few heads for me, Kit. I haven't seen bloodshed in so long. Aka Kitsune. Stop trying to warp Naruto's mind. You dare call the great QB no Yoko Obaka, I ought to rip you to shreds. But you can't, because you're caged. The Raiju countered. Now leave Naruto alone. Oh for Kami's sake, Raiju Kurama rolled his eyes, you're quite spineless for a celestial being. The kid has to kill soon enough, why not do it legally? Even though I have no desire to kill anyone in these exams unless I have to. QB does have a valid point, Kamina. The Raiju gaped in shock at his pupil as the Kitsune Chakra construct was grinning like a maniac. See, you Baka Raiju. Even the kid agrees with me. The Raiju grumbled about ungrateful blonde students and their biju plotting his downfall before gazing at Naruto's clones through the boy's eyes. Naruto, I've been meaning to ask. Why name your teammates after myself and Kurama? It just popped into my head. Naruto shrugged. Besides, I was under pressure and I worked better under it. I told you not to call me by name, you insolent ninja. QB roared in Naruto's mindscape. You said not to call you by name, QB never said anything about my Henjad Kage bunchens. Kurama was about to roar once more, but paused as he saw the logic in Naruto's statement. There was a period of silence, and Kamina and Naruto chuckled at the demon Kitsune before said Kitsune turned away with a scowl on its face. Smartus. It commented before closing its eyes in an effort to go to sleep. Good luck, Naruto. Keep those Kage bunchin alive until the end of the exam, and try not to get yourself killed. Hi, Kamina-sensei. Oh and tell QB thanks for the training. Kamina chuckled as he saw the nine-tailed demon wave an uncaring paw at Naruto's words. I don't need your thanks, Gaki. Naruto cut off the link between his inner demon and celestial being before his transformed clones grabbed him and ushered him to the front of the crowd of shinobi, where they were beginning to group together due to the examiner finally arriving. To say Naruto was in shock was an understatement. Before the similarly shocking series of genin level shinobi was a young boy who looked to be around Naruto's age, give or take a year or two. The boy was very, very pale in terms of his complexion, though living in a country that tended to blot out the sun, tended to cause that effect due to the lack of vitamin D in one system. He had dark colored eyes and slightly spiky, light blue hair. A pair of rectangular frame glasses was worn on his face that were connected to ear protectors. A dark blue turtleneck and camouflage patterned pants made his outfit along with a pair of dark blue shinobi sandals. His Kiri Hayatai 8 was attached to the center of a vest that he wore around his chest. Attached to his back by a belt was a large object wrapped in bandages. Two black handles protruded from the object's base. Kind of like that Kissam guy. Maybe it's a sword. Maybe it's one of the swords that belonged to the Seven Swordsmen. Naruto thought. 
The boy looked rather shy, but the boy suddenly shook his head as he cleared his mind of the fact that hundreds of shinobi, many from foreign countries, were now staring him down. He gave an unsure smile, revealing to many his shark-like teeth. Hello, my fellow shinobi. My name is Shijuro, and I am a member of the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist and wielder of the Blade Hiramekure. I have been chosen by the Honorable Mizuka Gesama as your examiner for this first section of the Kariga Kurchunin exams. Chijuro spoke with a confident tone, but despite its sound, Naruto could see the insecurity the boy was feeling. However, the boy's introduction was an eye-opener to the fact that he was not what he seemed. Chijuro seemed weak, but given the fact that he was a member of the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist, the most revered set of swordsmen in all of the elemental nations, as well as a successful wielder of a blade, spoke volumes of the young boy's strength, as most Seven Swordsmen members were at least high down into Anbu level in terms of strength. The boy then flashed through hand signs. Suiten. Mizu Bunshin no Jutsu. Suddenly, three clones of Chijuro appeared out of the air as the mist and the boy's chakra mixed and condensed to form the clones. The swordsman then took out a small ceiling scroll and unfurled it. In a puff of smoke, a small box appeared in his hands. Now then, each team will receive a number. So a single member of each team, come forward and put your hand in the box and take out a piece of paper. That would be your number. I will explain afterwards. The genin surrounding Chijuro nodded, and a single genin from each team went forth and took up their numbers from the box. Naruto reached in and felt around before settling his hands on a paper. Um, number 9. How ironic. He thought as he walked back to Kurama and Kamina. So boss, what did we get? Kamina asked. Number 9. He answered as Kage Bunshin. Kurama narrowed his eyes. That's rather ironic. It is, isn't it? Naruto and Kamina deadpanned. Once all the teams got their numbers, Chijuro spoke once more. Now all of you will be split up into four groups. There are about 100 teams taking place in the exams, so an equal 25 members will be in each group. Numbers 1 through 25 are with me, the original. Numbers 26 through 50 are with my first Mizubunshin. Numbers 51 through 75 are with Mizubunshin number 2, and the ones with numbers 76 through 100 are with my third. Now split up and follow your respective examiners. Chijuro explained. Naruto, Kamina and Kurama followed the original Chijuro. Naruto looked at the other 24 teams that were with him. They were three Kanoha Genin teams, but none that were part of his year of rookies, due to the fact they looked to be about two years older than him. There were two teams from Kumo, five from Iwa, two from Kusa, three from Taki, and the remainder were Karigakur Shinobi. Chijuro then stopped in front of the gated entrance to a large landscape that was fenced in. The mist covering the area didn't help lower the intimidation factor the area was supposed to give off, but Naruto had been in the forest of death, Father Achimaru, stared into the eyes of Abiju, two if he counted when he took on Shukaku during the invasion from Suna and Oda last year, and nearly took Ichidori through the chest from his former best friend. There was very little that scared him. Now then, this first part of the Chunin exams is a survival course. The area behind this fence is a large swamp and mangrove area that is home to many amphibious creatures, reptiles and a few land-based creatures as well. A majority of which are gargantuan in size, I would know since I was nearly killed there during my test to prove myself as a worthy member of the Seven Swordsmen. The Juro paused as he remembered nearly being eaten by a giant crocodile, before turning back to the genin before him, a blush of embarrassment on his face. This is Kurigakur's training ground, number 666. The Demon's Hunting Ground. Way to be subtle about it. As if the number doesn't give away the danger level of the place. Naruto rolled his eyes. The demon's hunting ground is quartered off, so there are four sections of this area. U25 teams are in the first quadrant of the grounds. In the center of the number 666 is a large facility where you all will have to go upon completion of this first test. However, your survival is not the only objective in this test. If you look at your number sheets you got earlier, you will see a picture stuck to the back of it. Chijuro paused as the genin took out their numbers and found Chijuro's statement to be true. There was a picture of a red and black box with the kanji for mist on it. I wonder what's in it. The blonde Jinchuriki thought. What is your object? Is the box correct? Chijuro asked. I got a red and black box, yeah. Same here. Us too. The responses were more or less the same, and so the blue-haired boy continued his explanation. Your secondary objective is to find that box. We have a fixed amount of boxes present in this quadrant, how much is a secret that I will not reveal to you all. You have three days to complete your task. So remember, survive, find your box and get to the facility in the center of the grounds within three days. Also, don't worry about venturing into other quadrants, we've sectioned those off with electrical fencing so in the end. You will still die by electrocution. Chijuro said with a nervous laugh, causing many to sweat drop at his bluntness. He's as blunt as that Mizuka gay. 
Kamina whispered. That's for sure. Kurama said. All right. Chijuro shouted to get everyone's attention. There are specific gates with your numbers on them, go find the men on my mark, you will enter this area. In a matter of minutes, the genin all reached their respective gates. Naruto and his two Henjad clones stared at the fenced entrance of gate number 9. All right. I have to keep you guys alive because well. Even though I can just make more clones and transform them, I don't want to waste too much chakra having to continuously recreate my teammates. We're counting on you to protect us, Bossama, Tobeo. Kamina and Karama hugged their creator causing Naruto to sweat drop at the red-haired and blue-haired clones. Way to keep the pressure on me. He deadpanned. Suddenly an audible click met the three Naruto's ears. Kamina, Karama and Naruto tensed their legs much like the other 70 genin present in his group, ready to take off. The shark-toothed boy's voice echoed through the mist-covered air as the gate suddenly shot open. Hajim. Hotel. Hiraya sat in the hotel bedroom as he contemplated his next move. He looked over the map which laid out his route for the next year and six months he had to train with Naruto. Okay, so we head to Taki after this. I wonder if their Jinchuriki will be willing to converse with Naruto. The Gama Sen inside before rummaging through his backpack and took out his notebook. Maybe some research will help me calm my boredom. Time to look for some brothels. Jiraiya gave a lecherous grin before opening the window, closing it as he stepped outside and began jumping from rooftop to rooftop in search of his intended destination. Training Ground 666 Demons Hunting Ground. Day 1. Naruto, Kamina and Kurama walked atop the waters of the marshy area they were currently in. Okay, boss. What's the plan? Kamina asked. Kurama decided to answer his fellow Kage Bunshin. I would think we should find some suitable land area in order to make a camp. I mean, sure we trained, or at least the boss did, with Hiro Kaiofu to use the water walking exercise to the point we could sleep on water, but I'd rather not considering that Chijuro guy's explanation of there being giant monsters and stuff in this place like the in the forest of death. The red-haired disguise clone said. Naruto nodded. You, or would it be I never mind, anyway, Kurama has a point. We should try to find a dry land area to make camp. Once we do that, I'll make a few more Kage bunshins to guard it while we go out and search for the box. We have three days, so we should find some dry land fast. I don't like how those bubbles in the water are looking. Naruto added as he warily eyed two bubbles that rose up from the murky waters, only for said bubbles to blink at him. Okay, those bubbles blinked. Let's move. Fast. Kamina said before jumping, his creator and Karama following with gusto. After a few hours of leaping across the water's surface, the group had finally come across a relatively large patch of dry land. It was small enough that Naruto thought that it couldn't even cover half of the quadrant his team was in, but large enough that it provided enough room to make a campsite without immediately being spotted, should someone have also found the land area. The mist in the air helped with that, but Naruto noticed that the amount of mist was noticeably that may have been due to the towering trees that were located on the piece of land. Alright, Kage Bunshin no Jutsu. Naruto made ten replicas of himself appear in plumes of smoke before reaching into his weapons pouch and took out a scroll. He opened it out revealing the seal array drawn on it. He placed it on the ground and then rested his hand on the seal, before pumping a small amount of chakra into it. Fuin. Kai. He said as his sleeping bag and his backpack which he kept his other supplies and appeared. Boy, boss, what about us? Where's our sleeping bags? Kamina asked. Yeah boss, we're your teammates. Despite us being temporary in this plane of existence. Kurama added. Naruto pinched the bridge of his nose before glaring at his teammates. Complain and I will replace you with another pair. Kamina and Karama nodded readily at their creator's words. Besides, they were clones that ran on exactly one-tenth of Naruto's massive chakra reserves, and due to them being non-living, in a sense, they required no sleep, water or food. Thus, we'll just be on guard duty with the others during the night shifts then. The two Henjad Kage bunshins muttered to themselves. Leaping from tree to tree in the misty forested area, the Naruto trio heightened their senses to their limits in order to search for the red and black box that would grant them access into the facility where the second part of their Chunin exams would take place. So boss, I know it's a bad time to ask. But do you know what you're doing and how we're going to find this box? Karama asked. Naruto sweat dropped as he turned to face his red-haired teammate. Not a clue. Kamina had sighted his creator's mind, but then again they were the same person so technically he and Kurama did have the same mindset as Naruto. The trio then paused as they felt pulses of chakra scattered throughout the forested area. A multitude of screams also met their ears, and the three winced at that. As the people are starting to dwindle. Kamina commented. Naruto nodded. Though I pity their losses, it only gives us that much of an advantage in getting those boxes. Come on, we have to keep moving. 
As they continued their search, Naruto's ears twitched, and he quickly took out a kunai and turned around. Kamina and Kurama did the same, only they drew their ninjatos. He sniffed the air, and the blonde Jinchiriki frowned as the mist was messing with his sense of smell. Guzo. Of all the times for my sense of smell to be a handicap. The blonde let his thoughts hang within his mind as he blocked a trio of shuriken headed his way with the kunai in his hand. He then threw said knife in the direction the metal stars came from, resulting in the figures he aimed at, having to move. Like hell you're getting away. Naruto growled. He reached into his weapons pouch and pulled out four seal tags, each one bearing a seal array made for a barrier-type seal. Kurama and Kamina worked on getting the trio of assailants enclosed which worked with a mixture of chazing and using kunai and shuriken in a method to cause them to divert towards the intended area. This worked on the first two members, and since the third member of the team, said team having been revealed to be from Kurigakur itself, went back for his teammates, Naruto took his chance. He quickly dropped down on the ground and placed the four seal tags on the ground before flashing through a few hand signs. You and Jutsu. Karaori. The seal tags glowed, and the Kiri team looked around and laughed. That did nothing. The first member laughed, a boy. Come on, let's get out of this trap the female member of the trio spoke sarcastically. Naruto looked at his Henjad clones with an evil grin. 3. Kamina started. 2. Kurama held up his two fingers. 1. Naruto finished the countdown as the three Kiri shinobi leaped towards the trio, only for them to slam face first against an invisible wall. They skidded down the wall as a pulse of blue chakra sent them flying back into the center of the sealed area. You're not getting out of there anytime soon I believe unless I want you to. You attack me so I doubt you guys have a box, and judging by your angry expressions, I would say that's an affirmative. Now since you prove a hindrance to my finding a box, you can guess what I'm going to do. Oh by the way, the barrier drains about an eighth of your chakra every minute, so you have about eight minutes before you fall into unconsciousness from its effects. Jana. Naruto gave a happy wave as the Kiri Shinobi spouted profanities at Naruto and his team. Can we activate the mute option of the barrier? Kurama asked. Naruto looked at the still yelling Kiri Shinobi before tapping the invisible wall of the barrier seal and sent a pulse of lightning elemental chakra running through it. Ride you arc. Shijeki. Arcs of blue lightning shot forth and lashed out at the loud shinobi and rendered them unconscious when it died down. I think QB's given the boss made the boss into a bit of a sadist. Kamina whispered as he noted the manic grin present on the blonde's face. You think Kurama spoke with a roll of his eyes before following their creator into the mist-covered trees of the demon's hunting ground. After a few more hours of searching with the assistance of about 50 Kage Bunshin he was a chakra beacon enough as it was, and making over 100 clones in the process would only work to have people find his position, and those with enough balls to find him and try to take him on would prove, in the words of one Nara Shikamaru troublesome and in the end, his search yielding no positive results. He and his teammates paused however, when they heard a high-pitched scream. Jumping down, Naruto, Kurama and Kamina looked to see a young girl around his age with short black hair, pale skin and black eyes. The Kanoichi's garb consisted of a red shirt and red pants with a black skirt worn around the pants that reached to just above her knees. She had on a pair of dark-colored shinobi sandals, and the red-clothed hit IR she wore around her forehead bore the symbol for a wagaker. However, other than the fact that the girl was alone, Naruto and his disguised clones couldn't help but notice the large pair of iguanas that were currently looking at the girl. The girl gritted her teeth before flashing through hand signs and slamming them on the ground. The large earth spike rose up and impaled one of the iguanas through its skull and killed it, but the second iguana lashed out with its tail and slammed it against the Iwa Kinoichi's body, sending her flying through the air. However, the Kinoichi opened her eyes a few seconds later when she realized she hadn't felt any pain from hitting the ground or a tree or any kind of surface for that matter. She looked up to find herself in the arms of one Yuzumaki Naruto before he landed on the ground. Kamina and Kurama landed beside the blonde as the young Iwa Kinoichi looked at her savior. Only to slap him. Ai Tai. Oi, what was that for? He yelled. I saved your life just now. So, I don't need saving, especially from a Kanoha shinobi. She growled when she took notice of the blonde's hit I ate. I need the box that is being held by that giant piece of shit. The Iwa Kinoichi said, and Naruto and his two teammates looked to see that the girl was telling the truth as the surviving iguana had a red and black cube. Inside its mouth. In its mouth. Naruto deadpanned as he let go of the Iwa Kinoichi. Said Kanoichi growled at the blonde before standing up and dusting herself off. Where are your teammates? Shouldn't they be helping you with this? My teammates are back at the campsite we made. They know I'm strong enough to handle myself, and I couldn't call myself a Tsuchikage's granddaughter if I wasn't. She said and then took off towards the brown and black reptile, leaving a shocked trio of Naruto's due to the bit about her being related to the Tsuchikage. Should we help her? Kurama asked. 
I would say we shouldn't, I mean she just said she was the leader of Iwa's granddaughter. But. It's against our principles. Karama said. What principle is that? Naruto asked. Save lovely young ladies in distress. Besides, I hate reptiles. We all do, Baka. Kamina said. We're the same person, remember. The boss just makes us look different for the sake of getting through this thing. Got a point there, plus. We get a box too. Karama grinned mischievously. The blonde and his henjet Kage bunchens took off as the Iwa Kanoichi jumped over the claw swipe from the iguana, only for its extremely long claws to extend from its other forelimb. She twisted, wincing in pain as the claws managed to graze her side. As she landed, she quickly went into a jump to avoid the tail, but the iguana proved to be extremely quick to follow, as it suddenly opened its jaws, prepared to eat her with its razor-sharp teeth. The Kanoichi's eyes widened only for Naruto's chakra-covered foot to crash against its lower jaw and shut the mouth of the lizard. I said I didn't need help. She yelled. Karama and Kamina slashed at the lizard's back limbs, sending it to the ground, immobile due to its tendons being sliced through by the wind chakra coated ninjados. Well you were about to be eaten so I would assume that you need help. Naruto said as he walked up to the Kanoichi. The Iwa Shinobi snarled at the blonde before sighing. Fine, but I can manipulate the earth so try and take that box and I'll skewer your testicles on an earth spike. Alright. But Tsuchikage's granddaughter threatened. Naruto's eyes widened as he unconsciously gripped his family jewels in fear. Hi, Kinoichi-sama. And the name is Kuritsuchi, not Kinoichi-sama. She growled before flashing through hand signs. Oten. Doryuuten no jutsu. A large earth dragon rose up from the ground and shot forth towards the iguana, but the giant reptile crushed it as it used its surprisingly strong upper body strength to smash its head. However, the iguana suddenly found its attacking forelimb missing as Naruto had sliced through it with his wind-enhanced ninjato. Kamina then went beneath the iguana's body and stabbed it in the chest with the kadachi it held, impaling a lung. Kurama then stopped the spasming reptile's desperate movements by slicing off its last usable limb, the right forelimb. As the iguana was now bleeding profusely and having trouble breathing, Kuritsuchi attacked. Oten. Iwa Jirchen. A large stone suddenly sprouted out of the ground beneath the iguana's throat and continued its upward movement before decapitating it. The brown and black head of the mighty reptile fell with a dull thud with blood leaking from it. Karama then opened the monster's jaws wider before reaching in and pulled out the black and red box with a toothy grin present on his face. Boy, I believed I threatened to sever your manhood if you took that thing from me. Now give it here, Blondie. Kuritsuchi said, making a gim-gim motion with her hands. The Jinchuriki and his disguised clones looked at one another and then back at the black-haired Kinoichi before them. First of all, the name is Yuzumaki Naruto. Secondly, why would I do that? It's an empty threat, I could easily escape with my teammates here. Naruto grinned and he held on to his clones. He then prepared to leap away with his Kage bunshins, only to find himself stationary. Hirama and Kamina felt themselves stuck to the ground too, and their eyes widened in shock as they looked down at the ground where their sandals were now trapped by a grey-coloured substance. Kuritsuchi then walked up to Karama and snatched the red and black box from him. Oh I. The red-haired boy exclaimed as he aimed to reach for the object only for the Iwa Genin to avoid the swipes at her. No can do, Yuzumaki-san. Kuritsuchi spoke with a sly smile. A copy of the girl then appeared next to her from behind the trio of Kanoha Shinobi, making their eyes widen. When did you? When you were busy with the iguana earlier, I made a countermeasure in case you pulled a stunt like this. I made it Tsuchi Bunshin and had it use my Yoten. Sakajo no Jutsu on you three so that it would stick you guys to the ground and allow me to take the box back. She grinned as she noted the angry, yet impressed, looks from the blonde and his teammates. Naruto growled in anger before his eyes flickered crimson as he held up his hands in a cross-shaped hand sign. Age Bunshin no Jutsu. Suddenly, thirty solid clones of the blonde appeared in multiple plumes of smoke. Some you guys, get us out of here. The rest of you, attack her and get the box back. Like hell you're getting this. Kuritsuchi said as the clones charged her for an overpowering physical frontal assault. The Iwan Inn and her earthen clone flashed through hand signs before taking a deep inhalation of air. Suitan. Mizurapa. A blast of water shot forth from both Karatsuchis's mouths, forming a conical shape like a trumpet's bell. The powerful wave of water washed over the Kage bunshins, causing many to dispel from the four with which they were struck with. See you later, Yuzumaki-san. I can tell you're strong so I'll be aiming for a fight with you soon. Kuritsuchi teased as she leaped into the trees. In those few seconds, Naruto was cursing as he finally was able to free himself, Kurama and Kamina from the surprisingly dense material with his clones, having finally managed to weaken it with numerous lashes from their ninjados. I'm probably going to regret not getting back that box. He muttered as Kuritsuchi had taken to the trees and headed back to her camp. 
Probably. Boss, you had it in your hands. You're going to regret not taking the box, period. You better hope we find another box soon, then otherwise Hiro Kaiofu is going to really kill you for not getting into the second part of the exam. And us too. Naruto sighed as he rubbed his head when Kurama hit him at the end of the mini rant he just did. After deciding to continue searching for any boxes, Naruto and his teammates made their own Kage Bunshin hordes to scout the area, only for them to be killed within mere minutes by attacking teams, wild animals, and the occasional brawl between each of the clones. Once they found that their search had yielded no results, Team Naruto decided to head back to the camp. The Mina leaped up to the top of a tree and scanned the area through the mist and found that it was dark. The light of the moon managed to penetrate the mist, even if it was only slightly. Guzo I can't believe the day went by so quickly. The blue-haired clone thought as he ran back down the tree, using chakra to stick to its surface. As he reached his creator and fellow Kage Bunshin, Kamina spoke. Guys, we have to head back to camp quickly. It's dark out right now and it'll be no help to look for a box now. Let's try again tomorrow. Alright, let's head back to the campsite. Kurama agreed. Naruto led the way back to the makeshift campsite. His guard clones had worked on using their few injutsu skills to create a protective barrier around the area while also gathering some firewood. Yo boss. A pair of clones walked up to the original with a fish as big as himself in their hands. Check what we caught, let's eat. Naruto grinned widely at himself before hugging the other two blondes. I love Kage Bunshins. He cried tears of joy. Well. We are you. One of the fish holding clones said. But if you love us then does that mean you're gay for us and therefore gay for yourself? One clone spoke, thus ruining the moment for a bit and resulted in him getting dispelled. Once the fire was made through the use of the wood and a small katen jutsu, the fish was gutted, sliced and cooked before the original and his clones dug into the fish. Once the eating was finished, Naruto yawned before crawling into his sleeping bag. But you guys want to sleep too. I mean I know you guys are clones and also you don't need it, but I can make more to watch over us, and if it's to keep up the disguise as my teammates you too could. Naruto told the red-haired and blue-haired teammates of his. The two shook their heads at the Raiju Arc user. Nah, it's okay boss. Me and Kamina can dispel if you want us to, besides you can always recreate us. You're the human one here so go to sleep, we got a box to find. Naruto nodded and closed his eyes. You do realize that once the boss loses enough focus on us during his sleep, we're going to be dispelled. One of the guard Kage Bunshin said. You'll just remake us. There's no trouble there and it's highly unlikely for us to be found. Kamina said as he put out the fire using a small amount of water from the mist in the air through Raiju Arc to make a small funnel cloud. Like Hiro Kaiofu said, fire, wind and lightning are cool elements, but the best element for a shinobi is shadow. Kurama quoted. The guard clones, Kurama and Kamina, continued with their watch, while also making sure the barrier seal protecting their creator's campsite was still intact. However, within the next three hours, they had all been dispelled by Naruto's mind, finally having lost its subconscious grip on keeping them in the plane of the living. A2. Naruto yawned as he stretched his limbs, cracking his neck and back, in order to relieve the tension in them. He blinked rapidly as his pupils dilated and expanded in order to regulate the amount of light that entered his eyes. Alright. This is the second day. I have to find a box by the end of today, or else I may be royally fucked, but where would I find a box? Naruto said to himself, tapping his chin in thought. He held up his hands and deactivated his barrier seal array that surrounded the campsite he and his Kage Bunshins had made and put all of his campsite's belongings into the storage scroll he carried with him. Learning few in Jutsu might have been one of the best things I had ever learned. The blonde Jinchuriki thought as he held up the scroll and placed it into one of the many pockets that were found on his pants. I won't need my Kage Bunshins to make my teammates until I find a box and reach the facility so I can finally ride solo for this thing. Naruto took off through the mist-covered landscape, leaping from one tree to the other, before dropping down to the ground as he detected a scent as well as heard a pair of loud noises below him. He landed softly and with barely any sound before hiding behind the tree he had dropped from. He peeked out from behind his coverage and saw three genin that appeared at least one year older than him. One had long red hair that reached just between her shoulder blades and had dark-colored skin, akin to that of a chocolate brown. She wore a black sleeveless top and long black pants with black shinobi sandals. She had on a pair of golden earring, and her hit I-8 was attached to a white cloth which she wore as a hairband, revealing that she and the two people beside her most likely her teammates, Naruto had thought were from Kumagakur. Her amber eyes seemed to glow in comparison to the slightly murky area of the demon's hunting ground. A small sword was attached to her back. The girl appeared to be beating down on a boy with similar skin color. The boy's black hit I-8 was wrapped around his forehead, and his white hair was in a spiky style akin to that of Naruto's. 
His dark-colored eyes glanced upwards with slight fear towards the girl that was currently attacking him. He wore a dark gray sweater and black pants with black shinobi sandals. His blade was attached to his back, just like the redhead's own, and in his mouth was a small stick that protruded from between his lips. Naruto immediately thought it was a cigarette, but when the boy opened his mouth to release a cry of pain from a rather painful blow to his skull, it was revealed to be just a regular red lollipop. Perry, Amoy will you two stop arguing. Your noise will get us found and that's not cool. The final member of the Kumo team spoke. Naruto's eyes widened as he noticed the girl, or more specifically, her above average sized breasts. Holy shit, they could be as big as Bachan's if she keeps this up. The blonde thought as he stared below the girl's neckline. The Kumo Kanoichi had short straight blonde hair that ended just below her neck. She had pale blue eyes and cream-colored skin, making her contrast greatly with her teammates. She wore a short gray dress of some sort over a mesh undershirt and a dark gray skirt. She had on a pair of red hand guards and high boots. Her tanto was strapped to her lower back. Omanasai, Samui-san. The boy, now known as Amoy, spoke. But Kerry keeps commenting on how she wants to hit somebody, and if she hits somebody. It could result in conflict and what if that person she hits is somebody of high stature of a foreign village, and she has to marry that person or kill herself in order to stop a potential war between Kumo and that village, and what if the result of that is? Amoy, Yurisai. Kerry slammed her fist down on Amoy's skull, silencing him as he released a hiss of pain. She's like Kumo's version of Sakura. Naruto sweat dropped at the thought. Samui rolled her eyes. Amoy, stop overreacting and Kerry stop yelling, it's not cool. Now come on, we have to find that box in order to advance through this first test. We've already wasted an entire day trying to find this land spot in order to escape the marshes where those giant reptiles lived. Samui said. Amoy and Kerry nodded, but just as they were about to move on, a large stomping sound was heard, and the Kumonin, as well as Naruto, stared in awe at the giant great blue heron that came stalking through the trees. The bird's large eyes zeroed in on the Kumo team before it reared its head up. A loud screech echoed through the air as it struck, its beak digging into the dirt as Team Samui leaped apart to avoid the attack. Naruto continued to watch as the bird of prey within the wetland area continued to strike at Team Samui. Brayton. Rakurai no Jutsu Amoy yelled as he finished his series of hand signs. A bolt of blue lightning shot forth from his fingertips and struck the heron in its chest, electrocuting it slightly, but due to its large size, it had a high rate of recovery, and so it spread its wings. One wing slammed against a tree, while the other sent Amoy into another tree. His back clashed painfully with the bark, leaving a noticeable indentation in it as he dropped to the ground, but Kerry was able to jump in front of him to stab the bird's beak with her lightning chakra-infused tanto. Carrie soared through the air, tanto in hand, as she was able to yank it free when the heron threw its back in pain. Perry then panted her feet firmly against the bark of the tree she aimed to ricochet off of and stabbed the great blue heron through its left wing. Blood flowed from the wound before the smell of burning flesh met the atmosphere as Carrie infused lightning chakra into the conductive blade once more. Amoy shook his head as he stood back up before sending another Rikurai no Jutsu at the bird, striking it in the eye this time. The great bird screeched once more in pain as it was now lacking the use of its left eyeball, which was now a bleed and burning mass of flesh. Perry and Amoy then leaped up against trees that were parallel to one another, before landing against a tree that lay directly behind the painted bird. They leaped off of the tree with enough force to crack the bark and channel chakra into their feet, sending the bird downwards from the force of the dual kicking strikes to the joint in its legs, bringing it to its knees. Samui then leaped up at the bird's throat before twisting as she drew her tanto. Kumorai. Amatajiri. She charged chakra into the blade and sliced the bird's throat cleanly, causing a massive amount of blood to pool in the bird's mouth, as well as causing the red liquid to spill from the wound. The large bird stepped backwards before falling to the ground with a gurgled screech. Within a matter of seconds, the tertiary consumer of the hunting ground's food chain had died. Naruto stared in awe at how the three had taken down the great blue heron. Sugoi. He yelled a bit too loudly. He covered his mouth with his hands and aimed to duck back behind his hiding spot, but it was too late. Team Samui had caught sight of the blonde Jinchiriki. Who are you? Samui asked with a cold tone. It is not cool to try and attack a proud shinobi of Kumagakur no Sado. Naruto raised his arms in a feeble defense. Oi, now hold on there, Kinoichi-san. I was just looking for a box myself when I came across you guys fighting that bird. Though I must say, I am very impressed. You guys took it down like it was nothing. Well, we are a pretty good team. Kerui said with a large amount of exaggerated pride in her voice. Naruto nodded before looking at Amoy and waved. Do you have any more of those lollipops? Naruto asked innocently. Samui, Kerry, and Amoy looked at each other with surprised looks. 
This Konoha shinobi had just appeared out of the blue, complimented them on their skills. And now was asking Amoy for a lollipop. Dust who the hell are you? Kerry asked. I am. He was cut off as Amoy suddenly began another exaggerated rant as to who he was. He's probably one of those shinobi that try to gain your trust and then slit your throat or stab you in the back, and I mean that both literally and figuratively. Or maybe he's secretly an examiner from Kiri that is under the guise of a Konoha shinobi in order to trick us or maybe. Amoy, Urasai. Doman. My teammates are very uncool when they argue. Samui spoke, but her cold gaze still remained. It's okay, but I can understand your teammate's mistrust. I am a foreign shinobi in this exam, and I am a fellow competitor who can most likely kill you. Team Samui tensed at that, but I won't. He said quickly, raising his arms to show he wasn't going to do anything violent. Where are your teammates? From what I heard, Kanoha is a very strict nation when it comes to teamwork. Samui said. Naruto blinked at his fellow blonde. We split up. He came up with an excuse right then and there. In order to find the box to move on, we decided to split up and cover more ground. Say, seeing as how I'm alone and stuff. You guys want to maybe work together. I know you guys are a team and all, but maybe we can help each other out. We can find a box for one another, but. I won't make a promise that I won't take the first box we find. They're surprisingly honest for someone who aims to use us. Usually people tend to remain quiet about it. Carrie said as she and her teammates had sheathed their blades, once realizing Naruto had truly meant them no harm. Naruto shrugged at the red-haired girl's comment. It's a blessing and a curse, but you'd be very surprised at how well I can lie. Naruto winked at the amber-eyed girl, causing her to gain a slightly flustered look. Well, I apologize for denying you the opportunity, but we will not be willing to work with you. The sole fair-skinned member of the Kumagakur team spoke. Naruto waved his hand at Samui. It's no problem, Samui-san. Kari-san, Amoi-san. I bid you adieu then, I hope to fight you, should we be able to move on to the rounds of this Chunin exam where we fight one another. Tadomat. Amoi yelled. How do you know our names? Well, you guys were practically yelling it out when I found you three. By the way. My name's Naruto. Yuzumaki Naruto, shinobi of Kanahagakur no Sato. See ya. Naruto then held up his hands in the ram sign and disappeared in a swirl of wind and a spark of lightning. That was pretty cool. Samui commented on the blonde's exit. Really, Samui? Yuzumaki Naruto. He must be a powerful shinobi sent to wipe out all of the genin and is hoping to add us to his shinobi army to take over the continent and then heal us. Amoy, Urasai. Kerry roared as she pounded her white-haired teammate into the dirt. Naruto reappeared in a swirl of wind and the sparks of lightning crackled beneath his feet as he landed on the ground. Boom. Raiju arc. Shunshin still needs some work. The lightning still tingles a bit. Naruto said as he shook his slightly numb body. I hope I will be able to fight one or all three of those Kumo shinobi. They seemed pretty strong. Especially the one with the huge knockers. Kurama teased the blonde, causing him to blush crimson. Iris I, Baka Kitsune. Naruto mentally shouted. This is not the time to be teasing the boy, Kurama. He needs to find that box to advance through this test, but the thing is that we have no idea where they would hide it. Kamina spoke, but a teasing grin suddenly found its way to the Raiju's face. Maybe it's hidden in that Samui girl's cleavage. Kamina sensei. Naruto blushed even more at the mental images the two powerful beings were sending him of him putting his hands on Samui's breasts. Stupid perverted all-powerful beings who just can't shut up. Naruto grumbled as he looked around training ground 666. He then decided that the forested area of the training ground proved to have no results. Maybe the swamp area has some clues or the exact location of a box. I had immediately left that place when I saw the weird stuff in there, but never checked it out. Naruto thought before heading towards the swampy area. As soon as he made his way to the edge of the swamp marshy area of the demon's hunting ground, Naruto surveyed the area and saw the murky waters through the slight amount of fog that covered it. He channeled Chakra into his feet and walked atop the water, fingering the hilt of the ninjato that he kept strapped to his back. The sound of croaking frogs, buzzing of insect wings and the low growls of whatever carnivorous creatures that lived in the marsh, assaulted Naruto's ears, his blue eyes scanning the area for anything that would be out of the ordinary. Or at least something that would try to eat him and spit out his bones. Kuzo. I wish I could just find a damn box and get the hell out of this place. It's making me itchy. He said as he scratched his scalp. However, Naruto was unaware of the creatures that saw Naruto's pause in movement, minus his itching, as a chance to strike. Like the saying goes, be careful what you wish for. Naruto's eyes widened as a loud hiss met his ears, and suddenly a large anaconda launched itself at him. He drew his ninjato and slashed the snake completely in half, as its forward motion allowed its open maw to meet the horizontally held ninjato that was coated in wind chakra. 
Snake blood and organs fell into the waters, but that was when three more anacondas reared their heads, gazing at their prey with evil yellow eyes. Well this is just fucking great. Naruto spoke sarcastically. The anacondas hissed before one lashed out at Naruto, aiming to swallow him whole. I've been eaten by a snake once already, I won't be eaten again. Naruto embedded his blade into the serpent's skull, stabbing into its brain. He then used his ninjato as an anchor and allowed himself to flip atop the dead anaconda's head before jumping up to avoid the second bite from the other anaconda. The third one lashed out with its lengthy tail, but the blonde Jinchuriki flashed through hand signs and activated his true secondary chakra nature of fire. Pain. Dukakuu no Jutsu the large fireball burned the appendage of the anaconda, causing it to hiss in pain and cause it to douse it in order to stop the fires from burning it further. Naruto was still airborne at the time, and so the second anaconda had struck, forming a spiral around Naruto's form, but before it could trap Naruto in its death grip, the blue-eyed Raiju arc user struck rapidly with his blade. Uzumaki Ryu. Taifu Rinpatsu. Naruto unleashed a flurry of sword strikes that were too fast for the normal eye to see. The anaconda suddenly froze as it was about to grip Naruto with its length, before numerous lash marks, with blood gushing outwards from every mark, littered its body. The eyes of the serpent suddenly became lifeless, and it crashed into the murky waters of the mixed ecosystem. Given that this place is a mixture of a mangrove, a swamp, a marsh and a rainforest all in one. I shouldn't be surprised if I see things like this, but god damn it, why do I always get attacked by the dangerous shit? Naruto yelled in his mind as he landed on the waters. The third and final anaconda hissed as it stared at Naruto, now aware of the danger its prey posed, and so it looked for a smarter tactic. Come on, you stupid reptile. Naruto flicked his blade, ridding it of the snake's blood. I'm not going to hurt you. I'll fucking kill you. Naruto gave the yellow-eyed creature a rather sadistic grin, akin to that of his bijuus. He channeled chakra into his ninjato before slicing the air. Uzumaki Ryu. Kazajiri. A distortion in the air suddenly graced the large serpent's presence, and a large diagonal slash formed on its body, causing it to hiss in pain before diving beneath the murky waters. Naruto cursed as he looked over the water, for a shadow or bubble. Any sign that would make him aware of the anaconda's presence. Kuzo. Come on you dirty snake. Naruto muttered. A bubble popped behind him and he leaped into the air, but it was for naught, as the anaconda's lengthy form easily caught up to him, and the reptile swallowed him like the tiny morsel he was. The snake licked its lips as it gave a nod of approval for finally eating its blonde prey. However, it suddenly froze, and the top half of its body was cut through cleanly, as a thin circle of chakra burst out of its body. Uzumaki Ryu. Enkin. The anaconda's body fell to the ground as Naruto leaped out of the sliced serpent. Naruto groaned. Kuzo. That's the second time. And during the same damn exam too. Naruto paused as he sniffed himself and recoiled in disgust. And now I smell like snake guts. Again. Why Kami-sama, do you hate me or something? He yelled at the mist-covered sky. His question was answered in the form of five anacondas, six tiger fish, one dozen mutated dragonflies, and a trio of giant snapping turtles bursting forth from the waters and the air surrounding him. Yeah. Kami-sama hates me. However, before he could prepare to fight with these reptiles. A loud roar echoed through the air. The blonde was placed into a state of confusion as he noticed the creatures surrounding him had now decided to fly away or dive beneath the water in what seemed to be out of fear. A few moments of silence greeted the Jinchuriki. He blinked in confusion when he felt something beneath him, and then a large amount of bubbles appeared in front of him. Naruto continued to stare at the bubbles before a large pillar of water shot up, dousing Naruto, but he was a bit thankful for it, seeing as how it got rid of the anaconda's flesh that covered his body and ninjato. The water pillar then fell, and Naruto could only drag his hand down his face in anger and frustration as he stared at the gigantic bipedal lizard that lay before him. Its scales were a deep green, and its forelimbs were now akin to muscular arms with five sharp claws on each one. Its back had many large silver spines protruding outwards and descended all the way to the tip of its large tail. Its deep yellow eyes seemed to glow, but Naruto noticed something around the giant monster's neck. It was a collar and a name tag. Ajira. He read before sweat dropping. Reptiles hate me. He deadpanned. No kidding, kit. Not now, QB Naruto answered the nine-tailed fox. However, though Gajira the mutated reptile scared the fuck out of the blonde, his fear was replaced by surprise and joy as he saw something else hanging from the collar's namatag. Could it be? It was. The box. He yelled in surprise. The blonde pumped his fists into the air before noticing the shadow that covered his form. Naruto looked out. Kamina's voice caused Naruto to take notice of his situation. His eyes quickly changed from happy to serious as he quickly channeled Chakra into his feet and took off in a burst of speed, avoiding the giant tail of Gajira. Gajira roared as it looked around for Naruto's form. 
Naruto appeared in the giant lizard's face, making its yellow eyes widen in shock. Naruto flashed through hand signs before clapping his hands together. Raiju arc. Ryu. A large cumulonimbus cloud suddenly coated Naruto's hands before a blast of wind and blue lightning shot forth and crashed into Gajira, with the booming sound of thunder resounding through the air. Gajira roared in pain, but quickly recovered and slashed at Naruto, his large forehand sending Naruto flying through the air and into the water. The blonde quickly resurfaced, only to be forced to dive back under to avoid the sweeping tail of the bipedal reptile. Gajira growled before his yellow eyes shone brighter, and it released a blast of green flame from its jaws. This creature couldn't be. Kamina thought. Really it can breathe fire Naruto yelled as he resurfaced behind the giant lizard. He quickly climbed atop the surface of the water before channeling wind chakra into his ninjato. Uzumaki Ryu. Kazajiri. The blades of wind shot at Gajira, but the hard and seemingly indestructible scales caused the attacks to not really affect the beast. The blonde cursed as Gajira took notice of the impacts however, and it turned and roared at the blonde. The QB Jinchiriki flew through the air from the shockwave that the roar generated and slammed into a tree. The blast of green flames followed after, but Naruto quickly performed Kawarimi no Jutsu with a nearby water weed before taking a deep breath as he finished a set of hand signs. Kain. Kiryu and no Jutsu. He yelled as the orange flames morphed into that of a dragon. The fire dragon slammed into Gajira's body causing a small explosion and burned the creature slightly. Naruto then used the smoke from his attack as a cover, and to the eyes of Gajira, he had appeared to have disappeared. The blonde had reappeared behind the overgrown lizard and formed his signature jutsu. In a large plume of smoke, 300 clones formed around the original Kyuubi Jinchuriki. Alright, 100 of you will make the first company. The next 100 will be the second company. The last of you are with me. First company, distract and bring it to its knees. Attack the back of its knees and back to push into the water. Second company, immobilize the son of a bitch with Raiju arc. The rest of you, we hit it hard and kick that Gajira monster's ass. Naruto ordered. Hi. Was the resounding reply from the Kage Bunshins. However, they had said the response a bit too loud as Gajira had heard it, and it turned around with a roar. The large shockwave and wave of water that resulted from the roar sent clones soaring despite them holding onto the water with chakra. However, they managed to recover and not be dispelled. The first company of clones then decided to carry out the first stage of Naruto's plan. The first company split into a 50-50 group. The first 50 began distracting it by throwing numerous explosive kunais and launching various katan and fuetan jutsus at it. Gajir roared before releasing a tongue of emerald fire, burning at least 35 clones in one shot. The swipe of its claws had ended the lives of the remainder. However, the other 50 had taken the chance to get back behind the beast once its focus had returned back to the distraction clones, and they all flashed through hand signs. Butin. Kami Arashi. Powerful bursts of wind accumulated around each clone before shooting forth and crashing into the gigantic reptile's back, sending it stumbling forward. The B-ranked Fuetan Jutsu had the ability to carve a trench into the ground and spear through trees, thus 50 of them would have had more than enough power to send Gajira stumbling, despite its powerful scales. Falling to its knees, Gajira snarled with rage, its yellow eyes burning with anger. Another blast of wind impacted with its back, however, Gajira proved to be very resilient as it was quick to counterattack. Its large heavy tail swept across the waters, sending many Kage Bunshins to their deaths. It turned its head and a green fireball shot forth and ended the first company's population. Despite that, Naruto saw the chance for the second company to strike. The Kuzo. The clones charged forth, circling the gargantuan reptile. Rain. Jibashi. Slamming their palms on the water after finishing their hand signs. Using the lightning element from the Raiju arc Keke Genkai, the first company clones sent forth great amounts of electrical energy across the conductive surface. The attack sped towards Gajira, and the massive lizard released a roar of pain as its body was electrocuted by approximately thousands of volts of electricity. Its body smoked as it fell to its knees, but the muscles contracted and relaxed at random intervals, too quickly causing its arms to give out as well when it collapsed onto all fours, thus bringing the beast down flat onto its stomach. It released a low growl, but then the second company of clones landed atop Gajira's body and slammed their hands down on its limbs after forming another string of hand signs. Buenjutsu. Hibiketsugu. A multitude of seals suddenly sprung forth from their hands and true to its name, snaked its way around the large reptile's limbs and some parts of its tail and torso. Gajira roared in anger, releasing torrents of fire that took out a bit of the second company's forces. However, the third company and the original Naruto took their chances. But the bound lizard now in place, they had all leaped into the air and charged chakra into the center of their palms. The Rasengan swirled to life before growing slightly larger in size to that of a basketball. Inpu. 
Adamara Sengen Renden. Naruto roared as he and 100 clones bombarded Gajira with powerful spheroids of rotating chakra. Gajira released a loud roar that echoed through the atmosphere of the demon's hunting ground. The birds that lived in the area flew into the air out of fear, and the large burst of chakra could have been felt halfway through the entire first quadrant and a bit by its adjacent quadrants. The bombardment resulted in a large dome of chakra forming, and a large wave of water crashing against the mangrove trees that lay on the shores, and a large crater with water swirling around it. The water then began to fill the crater, allowing the immobile body of Gajira, who had alone Naruto standing atop its form, to float to the surface, belly up. Gajira had chakra burns in areas that were bleeding from the spiraling chakra orbs on its back. Naruto reached over Gajira's collar and tugged at the red and black box that hung it. Victory is mine. Naruto whooped as he held the box high. As he said that, the numerous creatures that had surrounded him prior to Gajira's arrival had reappeared, bursting forth from the mist-covered waters, and the birds and insects descended from the skies. Suddenly, Naruto was being bowed down by the numerous fauna of Training Ground 666. And then Nani, he exclaimed. I'm impressed, Kit. It appeared that the giant lizard you fought just now was the leader of these creatures, and now that you've defeated them. You are now the leader of this place it seems. Kurama spoke. Nani how could you tell that? Naruto said out loud. Well it's the only logical explanation that would explain your situation. I mean, honesty kid, how else are you, a mere ninja, have gained the respect and apparent loyalty of all these animals? The giant kid soon argued. Naruto tapped his foot on Gajira's scaly stomach for a moment before nodding. I guess you're right. He said as he gave a small, unsure wave to the animal populace that surrounded him. A low growl was suddenly heard below him, and Naruto raised an eyebrow in surprise, as he saw Gajira was still conscious, but barely. Hmm, you really are one tough reptile. All of that and you're still alive. Naruto commented. Gajira's yellow eyes stared at Naruto as the blonde formed a hand sign. The monster flinched, but its eyes widened in surprise as the binding seals had disappeared. The beast growled in confusion. He wants to know why you don't kill him. Kamina translated for him. Naruto raised a curious eyebrow. You can understand it. He asked. The Raiju nodded inside of Naruto's mind. Yes. Gajira here is actually a descendant of an ancient set of beasts that had long since been extinct. A kaiju. However, from what I gather Gajira is the sole survivor apparently as I had bore witness to the fall of the kaiju when the gods had to wipe them out as their immense powers were beginning to go out of control and causing worldwide disasters. Kamina explained. Naruto smirked at Gajira and patted the beast's nose. So you're the last of your kind too, huh Gajira? The yellow-eyed lizard diverted its eyes from Naruto's before giving a slow nod. Well, so am I Naruto said. Gajira's eyes faced Naruto once more at that. The scaled behemoth gave a series of snarls and roars, before slowly grabbing Naruto in its forehand and standing up. Naruto cursed as he tried to free himself only to be dropped atop Gajira's head. You're going to help me now? Naruto asked. The kaiju descendant gave a positive nod causing Naruto to shake its head in amusement. Well this is interesting. Well then, Gajira. Can you take me to the center of this training ground? Ajira tilted its head in confusion, nearly causing Naruto to fall off as he gripped the spines, the large, well large in comparison to Naruto, spines that protruded from atop Ajira's skull. It then gave a low roar in response. Ajira asks if you mean the strange structure where the humans have been set to go to. Naruto thanked Kamina for the translation before answering. Hi. The very same. If you could get me there as fast as you can, that would help. Gajira gave a roar as if Naruto had challenged it before diving beneath the waters, Naruto holding on for dear life, as Gajira sped through the murky water at speeds Naruto could never hope to achieve. I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die. Naruto cried in I'm tears when Gajira leaped out of the water in a manner to show off to the new leader of the demon's hunting ground. The Jinchuriki's body flailed wildly like a rag doll's. Demon's hunting ground tune in exam facility. The large building that lay in the center of Kurigakur's most notorious and fearsome training ground was a large facility. It was made of gray stone and steel that allowed it to endure the elements. The building was rectangular in shape. It was taller than any other building in all of Kurigakur, save for the Mizuka Gaze Tower of course. It was colored a combination of gray, white and black in order to blend in with the surroundings of the mist-covered, mixed ecosystem. The structure had four columns, which were watchtowers in actuality, that were placed at each of the four corners of the facility. There was only entrance to the facility, and that was through the front entrance, and even then it was difficult to break through should one choose to, as the doors themselves were made of chakra-reinforced steel, and could be opened by an employee or in the case of this year's Chunin exams, by someone who held one of the red and black boxes. The Anbu Hunter Nin guards that were positioned within each of the watchtowers kept a watchful eye on the surrounding mangrove marsh that surrounded the facility. 
So, do you think anyone else will get through? So far, only six teams have gotten through to this place so far. One guard commented. The masked hunter Nin shrugged at his fellow Anbu hunter Nin member. I don't know, but it's only been one day. Those Gaka still have today and the end of tomorrow to complete this first exam. True, but. Hey what's that the guards paused as they heard a loud stomping sound. The hunter Nins, even the ones within the towers that weren't positioned where the two currently speaking ones were located, were able to feel the tremors. What the hell? Is that? Gajira the hunter Nin exclaimed. Yeah and he's coming this way. Why is Gajira coming here? The hunter Nin suddenly began to mobilize and stood at the ready in case the ground's most powerful creature decided to attack. However, they were in shock, for when the gargantuan reptile stopped in front of the facility, it dropped down on all fours, resulting in another tremor, revealing Naruto with two Kage bunshins, transformed into his fake teammates, Kurama and Kamina. Naruto held up the box that would be required for his entry into the area and tossed it at one of the surprised Anbu, who quickly reacted and grabbed the object. Thanks Gajira. Keep this place in line, okay? I'm not going to be around this place often. The green-scaled, yellow-eyed beast gave a bestial roar before giving a toothy grin at the blonde before turning and walking away. Why why you? Tamed Gajira. The hunter nins all stared through their masks with disbelief. How did you did you do that? One asked. Naruto, Kurama and Kamina grinned toothily. Easy. We beat him. His response would have caused their jaws to hit the ground, but they refrained from doing so, despite their want to. Now then. If you don't mind. I'd like to get in here please. The blonde and his teammates pointed at the large towering piece of infrastructure. Uh, hi. The hunter nin that had caught Naruto's toss box walked over to the door and placed his hand against the steel door before sending a pulse of chakra through it. A compartment in the wall on the left suddenly opened up and the hunter nin placed the red and black box within the square-shaped slot that was there. Another pulse chakra was released before a grid-like pattern made entirely of chakra sped across the wall and over the door. A loud clunk was heard as the tumblers in the doors began to turn, and the doors slowly opened. Naruto looked at his disguised Kage bunshins and nodded before walking through the doors. Now let's see what you guys have in store for me. Thanks for watching guys. Hope you all are enjoyed this video. If you do please leave a like share and subscribe also don't forget to support author of this fanfic. So let's end this video here. Until then see you in next video.